our viewers watching live on the Council's YouTube channel, Hillingdon, London. This is a meeting of the uh, Residence Education and Environmental Services Policy Overview Committee. Uh, my name is Council Wayne Bridges and I am Chairman of this meeting. The key role of this committee is to monitor the performance of local public services within its remit and to hold in-depth reviews on topics of residents' interest. We engage with a range of external witnesses in our activity, which can include community groups, residents and subject matter experts. Where we identify areas for change or improvement, we make recommendations to the decision-making cabinet. Details of the business to be considered today is shown on the agenda, copies of which are available in the room and also accessible on the YouTube underneath the broadcast. For those present in the room and attending to speak, please note that you will be filmed and any statements you make will be recorded and made public. And for those in the public gallery, you will not be on camera. A reminder to councillors, officers and those speaking today that you should turn the microphone button on when speaking. This will ensure you can be heard in the room and by those watching online. So first of all, going around the table tonight, allow me to introduce the people present. To my right is Councillor Mark Markham, the Vice Chairman, Councillor Steve Tuckwell, Councillor Hina McGuana, Councillor Paula Rodriguez, Councillor Derry Radia, Councillor Brian Stead. To my left, Neil Fraser, Democratic Services, Councillor Jan Sweeting, the Labour Lead, Councillor Stuart Mavis, Sarah Phillips and Dan Kennedy. And we're also delighted to welcome our witnesses this evening, uh, Ms. Jane Turnbull, Colleen Sullivan, Mr. Pua, David Buff, and Claire Kinn. Very good evening to you all. Uh, a few house rules before we begin. We're not expecting the fire alarm to uh, sound this evening. However, if one does go off, please follow the officers to the exits. Uh, mobile phones to be placed on silent or switched off. Uh, and if we have any other residents here this evening, feedback forms are available through the clerk. Uh, with that said, we start with apologies for absence, please. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, apologies to Mr. Chief and Councillor Kaufman, with Councillor Ted Prison as a substitute, and Tony Little. Thank you, and thank you to those who are substituting this evening. Uh, any declaration of interest in matters coming before this meeting? Nope. I can confirm that all business this evening will be discussed in Part 1, uh, which moves us on to Item 4 to agree the minutes of the previous meeting. Are there any members wishing to speak? Councillor Sweeten? Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank the clerk for the excellent detailed minutes that we have before us and the additional information that we've all received, including that very large map for the residence parking. <laughs> um, however, we have a similar situation that we had last time, and that is, although we don't have a matters arising from the minutes, we have matters pending from the minutes. And I think there are 11 matters pending, um, I don't know whether it's, it's now um, reasonable for me to go through those or if I can just pass them to the clerk or whatever way you want me to play it. But it, it's such as um, the safety team could undertake further analysis of collision hotspots, putting together literature to aid counsellors when approaching schools, i.e. road safety, information to HARA concerning air quality projects, etc., <coughs> etc. So... Um, I think maybe in future it would be good to have a, a sort of highlighted list of the things that are still pending so that we, we capture them and make certain that we are dealing with the issues that we have discussed at the previous meeting, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, we can note those, uh, as you're aware, Councillor Sweeting, you do receive copies of the draft minutes in format before coming to this committee. If you are available to read through them beforehand and suggest any changes to the clerk before they're printed, that would also be beneficial. It's not changing to the minutes, it's just pending from the minutes. So yeah. the minutes are correct, but there are items from the minutes that um, were going to come to us or were being considered. For example, there's one about the report on the local plan part two being I possibly okay. brought to a That's future meeting. Yep. It's just mat matters pending, not anything at all wrong with the minutes. The minutes are absolutely excellent and correct. That's fine. We can get a list. That's fine. Okay, is that agreed? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we move on to our uh, next item, which is the review into littering and fly tipping. We're in Hillingdon, our witness session. Uh, again, welcome to those who are attending as part of the witnesses. I will begin with Mr. Buff and Mr. Pua, who I understand are doing a joint presentation, and then we'll move on to the other residents in present. So whenever you're ready, Mr. Buff and Mr. Pua. Right. <coughs> Thank you very much indeed. Um, first of all, could I say... Um, we're very grateful to be invited 
to this meeting and we're delighted that you are doing this review in Hayes Town uh, littering and rubbish dumping is a big issue um, Mr Puar and I are both passionate about doing something about it um, so uh, just for the, the benefit of members um, the Hayes Town Partnership which I chair is a body set up by Hillingdon Council about 17 years ago I think uh, to promote the economic regeneration of Hayes Town and it includes representatives of the council, the police, Hillingdon Chamber of Commerce, um, Hayes Town Business Forum and major uh, developers and employers in Hayes and the Business Forum is the um, Hayes branch of the Hillingdon Chamber of Commerce. Uh, Mr Puar has been in business in Hayes for 40 years um, and we have in, in the forum now about 60 members of small independent traders. So we work very closely together. Um, I often tell people we're brothers, really. You've just got a better beard than me. Um, uh, you know, we, we are a partnership and, and we, we've been out all day today um, delivering um, forms for our Hayestown treasure hunt around the local school. So uh, we are a partnership. So the scale of the problem in, in Hayes is significant um, and we've done quite a lot of things uh, to try and tackle the problem. Um, we've had a degree of success uh, but um, the problem still remains. You know, the amount of litter on the streets and the amount of black bags dumped at bins um, is just too much. So uh, what we're going to talk about today is things we've tried um, where we've had some success and, and where we think our experience might be relevant to um, this committee. So uh, starting off, I think you know, there, there are actually there's more than one problem um, when you talk about this. There's the litter. Um, then secondly, there's bags of rubbish left in the street. Um, then there's dumping of furniture, fridges and other appliances. Um, then there's organised dumping you know, by people who collect it and then just deposit it on other people's land. And then a particular issue for us in Hayes is people who put food out for feeding pigeons, yes. uh, which is another form of littering. So in, in Hayes, the, it's the general litter and the black bags that drive us mad, um, and that's what we want to talk about. So um, I've divided what uh, we're going to present into various sections um, starting with working with businesses um, we know that quite a number of the black bags that get dumped in the street are from businesses and some are from residents who live in flats over shops though we, we don't know exactly uh, the numbers between them but um, we got very fed up with this some years ago and we made our own unofficial poster uh, which we actually put up um, in shops and other places, um, which um, the council is um, pleased to say has now followed. But we just did something very simple like this, because I think one of the lessons I, I would highlight uh, from our experience is you've got to communicate in very plain terms. And some of the posters that the council has produced, you know, they're very nicely designed. Um, they look very attractive, but do they really work? Um, so we actually had a big problem in Cold Harbour Lane, and sometimes we had as many as 85, 85 bags that we counted one day that were just being left in the street. And we put these posters up, and the problem stopped. So you know, simple communication is, is uh, um, and minimum number of words, particularly in Hayes, as you'll know, We've got a very diverse population, a lot of people whose first language is not English, uh, but even people whose first language is English don't read wordy posters. Uh, this, this is quite punchy, you know, shows you uh, the, the issue in a pictogram style um, and it concentrates the mind um, on a £400 fine. Um, so that, that's, that's our first uh, uh, piece of evidence, if you like. Um, we lobbied the council to produce a um, similar thing and uh, we've now got these put up in uh, quite a number of shops. Uh, but um, we'd like to do more 
of, of because at this poster we think what the council's produced is very good, um, but um, we've got to do more to make the impact. And um, one of the things that we uh, would like considered really is uh, um, have these actually on the waste bins, you know, because that's where people put in black bags is right on the bins. Um, we tried putting them on the bins, but the rain soon washed them away. So, you know, we'd need a laminated, laminated. form. Yeah. Um, the next thing that we've done with the council um, is uh, we've produced a joint letter uh, between the council and the business forum to go to every shop and every resident in Hayes. Um, it, it, it's taken, how, how long has it taken? About nine months yeah. since the idea. Um, but we've actually got it now and it's in the pack that uh, I've just given you beyond, at the back of that uh, poster. So the idea of that is that we're working together uh, between the businesses and um, the council and appealing to the traders and the residents to join with us to make our town better. Um, so a bit of encouragement, exhortation um, uh, followed up with prosecution if people don't play the game uh, but um, you'll see from the letter that um, we're, we're trying to emphasize it's our town you know we want to make it nice for people to live there uh, we want to make it nice for people to come shopping and at the moment we're not succeeding in that uh, yeah so um, so that it, we got it last week printed so it hasn't gone round yet um, we can't measure its impact um, but uh, we liked the uh, fact that the council gave us a positive response to the idea of doing something jointly. Uh, it's just taken a long time, but we've got there, uh, so let's see how that goes. Um, the Business Forum has shown support for the council in prosecuting those traders who are caught putting their rubbish out in the street. Um, and you know, sometimes, Mr Poor, you've actually warned people that they're going to be prosecuted and you know, get the message, get that bag off the street, otherwise you'll be prosecuted. And that's been yeah, quite yeah, effective, I, isn't I it? Tell, I tell them I'm going to take that picture and report to GVP and take it away. And they think I'm official. Yeah. <laughs> and they think he's from the council. <laughs> it was a long time ago. <laughs> so um, I think the point that we would make on these um, inspections, I think they're called duty of care inspections in the jargon, um, the the council um, turns up at a shop and says, yes. where's your paperwork for Sunday. disposing of um, rubbish? Mm -hmm. And that's a perfectly legitimate activity. Um, but uh, there are two things, really, from our experience. One is it's a bit hit and miss about which shops are done and when. Um, we think um, if there was a planned programme over a period uh, highlighting sections of the town um, that would be more effective. And the second thing is uh, about um, how you actually get the message across to people. Um, is we have had instances of um, an Indian restaurant where an inspector turned up on a, a Sunday morning and you know Indian restaurants usually close very late at night uh, so the proprietor wasn't there, there was somebody in the kitchen. Um, where's the paperwork? Um, the person concerned didn't know, uh, tried to contact the owner and then um, uh, was given a couple of hours and then fined £180. Now, uh, you know, that is, to us was heavy handed. Um, you've, got, you've got to try and win people over, um, give them warnings and then if they carry on not complying, then you find them. Uh, um, you know, that's a measured, proportionate response. And lastly, um, in terms of the traders, um, I produce a weekly email news bulletin called Hayes Town News. Uh, not a very imaginative title, but <laughs> best I could come up with. Um, we send that out to nearly 500 local groups and individuals involved in the town. So when there is a successful prosecution, um, um, I publicise it in Hayes Town News. And you know, people who want to see a clean town um, really are pleased to see the council's doing something. 
but um, it's a bit hit and miss again about which ones we find out about. So uh, we we would like to have more of that um, so that we can um, get the message across you know, to the public that we're working together to make the town better, and to the perpetrators that um, stop doing this, otherwise you'll get fined four hundred pounds. So um, those are the issues for um, businesses. Um, moving on to the residents, um, the residents in the flats over the shops definitely contribute to the problems. Uh, we've got one particular area in Hayes, Berlin Court, um, which um, you know where I'm talking about. Um, they've got no proper system for their rubbish and they put it out on the street every day and it drives us mad. Um, and drive some of the councillors mad because you know, the managers of the property are not playing the game really um, but we'd like to see more use of CCTV um, in tackling that because it's happening literally every day um, it would not be difficult to track it through CCTV um, and secondly um, searching the bags in some ways the council has become a victim of its own efficiency uh, when the rubbish is reported it's removed very quickly and so some people might get it into their head that's a system you put the rubbish out and it's taken away um, you know, I think we need to explain to people more that it's not the system um, and um, going through the bags and finding out um, addresses of people who might have left envelopes in there and they do um, and then uh, finding them um, there's a particular problem in Hayes about rear alleyways and the rubbish that gets dumped in those and we've organised a number of um, clearances with, 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 with the uh, traders and the residents but, um, it's very, very difficult, slow and cumbersome, and the council does use its powers to um, inform owners, but you know, sometimes you've got multiple ownership, 20 plus people, and that's a very cumbersome uh, system, but um, we need to do more of it. There's no collection of recycled materials in Hayes Town, um, and there's no collection of garden waste. Now, we don't have a lot of gardens in the town, but there are some developments with gardens. So um, we don't know why there's no recycled materials collected in the town, um, and that's something uh, which would help. So um, all the flats in Hayes are private landlords, um, and um, we did suggest a while ago that the council might use the landlords' forum um, to actually get across their responsibilities. Um, I mean, the drawback of that, we realise, is that the people on the Landlords Forum are probably res responsible people and they're not the right audience, but it you know, would help. Um, so anything more that could be done uh, to um, alert landlords to their responsibilities, we think would be a good idea. Now, the council is um, one of the few in London, uh, certainly in, probably in the country, that uh, does free collection of bulky household goods. Uh, it used to be, as you know, just for pensioners, and it's now for everybody. Um, so for residents, there's no excuse for dumping mattresses and fridges and so on in, in the street. Uh, but when we talk to people, most of them don't know about it. Um, and when you look on the council's website it's not that obvious it doesn't jump out at you that that service is available so we, we think uh, there's more publicity needed in terms of um, that free service and the next um, area to cover is working with councillors uh, we've got two wards that cover Hayes Town, Botwell and Townfield and um, the councillors, yeah, we work with them very well. There's um, three councillors in particular uh, who are really hot on this subject. Um, Councillor Sweeting's looking, looking as she's guessing who they might be. Um, and they, they're very good at reporting. And often we would uh, contact them uh, because they are aware, as we are, about what's going on. And the members' inquiry system is actually quicker 
than if we report. So, so working with councillors is really important. Um, next item is working with school children. One, one of the things that we've done in Hayes, um, in that pack we've given you, um, we worked with three primary schools in Hayes on what we called cleaner and greener Hayes. It, it, it's now, I didn't realise it was quite so long ago, 2012 we started it. We, we, we did this for about four years. Um, and uh, I won't go through the detail, we haven't got the time, but you could see just by glancing at this leaflet that we achieved a tremendous uh, engagement by the school children. We had uh, children in the council chamber, to, to, you know, primary school children, doing PowerPoint presentation in front of Jean Palmer. It's just fantastic to see with all their ideas about how we could uh, improve the town. Um, and one thing we organised was a demo uh, where the children made uh, placards and on the back of that you can see some really great um, catchy uh, slogans that they got and one school even um, had a song uh, which was performed on Hayes FM um, which was, was lovely um, and Mr Puar and I we put a lot of effort into this and we attended meetings regularly at the schools um, it depended on two things really one was having commitment from the schools and very often it was one individual teacher and secondly having some support from the civic centre uh, we, we had um, um, a very good officer helping us uh, helping the process um, Julia Heggy, who was in um, health promotion um, there's no officer now uh, that we're aware of doing this and uh, I think we're prepared to do it with the schools uh, again, uh, but it needs resources from within the council uh, to actually support it. You know, we're, we're both volunteers um, and we give a lot of time to other things in the town, so we haven't got all the time, we haven't got all the connections with the schools either. So um, we, we would like to see more of that um, and we would help do it. Um, volunteering is the uh, almost through the presentation um, I mentioned we've done uh, clear ups of the alleyways uh, but there's a whole lot of other volunteering going on in Hayes as well so the Hayes Town Partnership is a member of the Hillingdon Canals Partnership mm -hmm. and we've got the Grand Union Canal going through the middle of the town the canal towpath is one of the worst areas for littering and it's very much down to the drinkers who get down there and just throw cans and bottles all over the place. So from time to time we organise clear-ups and we've been very successful in engaging mm. volunteers from our diverse community. So uh, one occasion we had 28 people from the Nepalese Gurkha community and collected 50 bags of rubbish. Uh, we've had the Hayes Muslim Centre um, and uh, more recently uh, we've had the um, Kubar Muslim Centre as well so um, that work uh, particularly in t terms of the Canal Partnership um, Canal and River Trust is as concerned as we are about the litter and they have a system of what they call adoptions where local residents can adopt a stretch of towpath and we've got one of those now in Hay. So a few people who live in the High Point Village in the centre of town um, have started uh, an adoption scheme. So um, that keeps on top of it. Um, the last one before last is about um, community payback. Um, again, working through the Canals Partnership, um, we've established links with the London Community Rehabilitation Company, uh, which is the company that works with London Probation on community payback. And we've got a um, scheme in uh, Hayes and in West Drayton as well, uh, or usually rather than West Drayton. Um, it's been very time consuming in setting these things up because you have to provide a place where the people on community payback can use a toilet, have a 
refreshment break. But using my contacts in Hayes, we've got the YMCA to agree they can use the youth centre on a Sunday when it's not being used by young people. And the council has agreed to provide a trade uh, refuse bin for them to put the rubbish in and have it taken away free of charge. So you know, a very good example of partnership. It's not actually started yet, um, but um, you know, I think that's got real potential in terms of uh, doing the clear up because some areas volunteers can cope with, but in some places the scale of the problem is too big for volunteers and you can't expect people to keep coming out um, regularly doing the same stretch of tow path, you know, every couple of weeks because it gets demoralising, frankly. Uh, but people on community payback, um, you know, they have to do it. So um, I think that's a good system. And again, you know, it may be that we... I don't know where else it's used in the borough, actually, but uh, there could be other places that uh, you think of that it would be relevant. And the last bit is uh, working with street cleaners. And just um, after you'd invited us to come to this meeting, um, by coincidence, I was contacted by some academics from Brunel and Sussex universities. Uh, I've got good contacts with Brunel. Um, and they um, told me about a project that they'd done um, where they'd engage with street cleaners. And I was really interested to find out and thought of that angle of it, really. Uh, but they did it in about six boroughs in London, including Hillingdon, uh, where they uh, w worked the streets with the street cleaners and interviewed street cleaners about their job, how they were treated by the public, and how they could help um, convince the public to sort of join with them, making the towns less messy. Um, the depressing part of their research was the amount of abuse that street cleaners got from the public. Uh, not as bad as parking wardens, evidently, but uh, surprisingly high. Um, but they're now working um, in Southwark um, with a project on how could they take forward this research um, in order to change public attitudes. And they're looking particularly at um, you know, this how do you prod people into changing their behaviour? And um, if, if the committee was um, willing and interested and you had time in your timetable, they would be uh, willing to come and um, tell you about their research and so you could assess uh, whether there's anything in it for Hillingdon in doing some more work on the ground. So... Um, I think I've covered all of the issues um, that we're dealing with um, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for that very informative presentation, uh, Mr. Buff and Mr. Brewer. Before I go to members' questions, I think it would be beneficial if we hear the presentations and comments from witnesses in all before we go to questions. So at this point, I'd invite perhaps the Barnhill residents if they would like to comment at all. Claire and Kieran, would you like to say anything? Yes, sir, Could you put your mic on, please? Mic on, sorry, yeah. Okay. Thank you. So what David says, we account for exactly the same issue around our way. So I live around the, um, just off the Oxbridge Road. Coleridge Way is a hot spot for tipping. So we have mattresses, cupboards, anything people don't want, it's dumped. Summer, we have all the builders who refuse to get skits. All the rubbish is dumped. So we've had baths, toilets, kitchen sinks, everything. Um, again, it's, it's general bags of rubbish that are left, and I'm constantly, every week, I phone the council up um, um, and, send, and I complain about it. They come and they pick the rubbish away. They say, we'll pick it up in 24 hours. You know, fine, they come and do that. But what I find is that the more they're picking up, people think, oh, you know, we'll, we'll just dump it there. You know, go and dump it on Coleridge Way or go and dump it on Shakespeare Avenue because the council will come and pick it up. So, um, so <clears throat> three years I've been complaining. So eventually they did put signs. I think they're about this size. Um, it has helped. I'm not sure. But um, I don't think many people are taking notice of those signs. They're not, they're not big enough. You know, the, 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 the size of this. You know, dumping. They simply are not big enough. And I said to me, we needed those really big yellow 
fines, you know, as, I, as, as David was saying, like, you are going to be fined. So, um, and then again, we've got the shopkeepers who dump all their rubbish. So I've complained to the council again and again. And they were actually very good because they actually investigated a lot of the shops on Belmore Parade and they did fine a lot of people and they sent me a list of all these shops that they did fine that they did quite good work on that but you know it's constant but I've also found it's not more the residents who make the mess it's more the tenants I just find that there's too many tenants around our way now um, so there's lots of tenants a lot of houses that are, are rented out and especially on the shops uh, on the um, flats above the shops so as soon as those new tenants come what they come is they dump all their rubbish on the street Thank you very much Kieran um, Claire would you like to say anything? Yeah Oh sorry <laughs> Cut me off. Um, really echo what um, yeah, David and Kieran have, have said uh, my street is again notorious for having fly tipped waste and litter as well, black bags as I mentioned um, it becomes a real um, battle and as you say that you know, council being a victim of its own success, when I had some renovation work done on the house and we had some bits and pieces outside a child <laughs> walked past and said, oh you know if you leave that over at the garages the council come and collect <laughs> it <laughs> So they do think it's a service, so, yeah, <laughs> that was a child that they were uh, no higher than this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that. Great. Um, yeah, it, it, what I find most disturbing, really, where the, the waste is collecting on our road is put out by the residents themselves, so they're living within this squalor themselves. Um, the bins go on a Wednesday. By Wednesday evening, there's fresh black bags out mm. already. Um, again, you know, bag checking, things like that. Um, it, it's a massive problem. I, I, don't, <laughs> I, don't, I haven't got any magic answers because I think it's bigger than a borough. It's bigger than that. Everything is convenient <laughs> to have. And if we didn't create the litter in the first place, then it wouldn't be there to put out in the long term. Um, but rats, mm -hmm. yeah, so we'll drive down the road and there'll be one squashed in the road. Um, uh, again, the council are very good at coming out and, and responding to those as well. I tend to report my issues via the Fix My Street app. Um, I, the last lot I reported was on the 8th of October and today it was removed so it's a, a pretty efficient service but again it's it's clear now dare I say in the morning it won't be um, but if an area is repeatedly cleared let's get some of these signs up let's, let's put something down there so that right okay it's clear now we're at a fresh start now if there's anything here we'll attribute it to whoever owns these bags etc as well um, society's changed it's a disposable society now I don't know um, like you say about prodding children to prod their parents to do that there seems to be a generation in between the mend and make do generation and this upcoming generation now but um, in doing so and maybe bins that are in Town or surrounding uh, changed jobs recently, had to get public transport uh, as an eye opener. There's no real bins on buses. Um, I, I know why people put devices and things in them to disrupt the, <laughs> the running of buses, but if we don't have it on there, then it, it just falls to the floor. It's okay to eat in public now and just throw the litter down. You know, gone are the days. Um, I'm sort of harking back to yesteryear, but you know, gone are the days where you go home and have your dinner. <laughs> you don't need it in a wrapper, and then be able to mm. to throw it down. But maybe bins are not large enough or changed regular enough, you know, to prevent that overflowing. I've seen several bins in my local area that mm -hmm. I just mm -hmm. jammed, and even if I wanted to get a banana skin in there, I I, I really couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, it just becomes a bit uh, crazy. 
I don't know if you can get fast food outlets to become accountable for what they're doing and again in communal areas because um, the particular area that I speak of with the fly tipping etc it's all masonettes it's rented um, and when a tenant goes the owner of the place they just week everything out, mattresses, mm -hmm. fridges, mm -hmm. whatever you desire. Aladdin's Bazaar comes out onto this front um, garden of somebody. They've got bins, but they're covered in, in brambles now. You know, what can we do to, to get each resident or each owner of each masonette joined up and, and thinking together to get that cleared and, and get that out, really? I don't know. <laughs> Thank you very much for your feedback. Um, and finally, Oak Farm Residents Association, Jane or Colleen, would you like to speak? To let you know what we do? Yes, of yeah. course. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Colleen Sullivan, and I'm chair of the Oak Farm Residents Association. The association was founded in 1932, but I've only been chair for the last two years. Um, our association covers an area from Friesland Way and finishes at Clifton Gardens and covers all the roads in between. At present we have about 25 members, uh, regular members, and with the introduction of guest speakers, our monthly meetings have sort of interest with the residents has grown. Uh, we've also introduced flyers and leaflets promoting OFRA in and around our ward, and this has certainly borne fruit. Our association works closely with our councillors, the police and we have introduced community events such as the Christmas Bazaar, Easter Extravaganza and Quiz Nights. Um, sorry, and we have 50 plus on Facebook. Thank you very much. Uh, Jane, is there anything you'd like to speak in terms of uh, littering and fly tipping? Or? Um, the, I think we're very lucky with Ofra. We've got lots of parks, small ones and, and some bigger ones. Um, and they are very well maintained by the council. But of course, out comes the good weather, out comes picnics, um, out comes the, uh, the rubbish. And um, people will carry everything to the park and then not bother to carry it home again. Um, we also have lots of um, back alleyways and access roads. Unfortunately, many of them are now gated and are therefore the responsibility of the houses that back into them. Um, and the council can't get in there to do anything uh, because gates are locked. Um, our collection day, as with yours, we've, people uh, do tend to put their rubbish out a bit early. Um, I've seen things out our collection day down my street is Wednesday. I've seen things out on Sunday evening, Monday evening. It's improved since the introduction of the food bins because now the crows and the foxes don't scatter everything quite so far uh, as long as people put a, the, the stuff in the food bins. But as a lot of people have said, the borough is very good at coming along and reacting to any uh, complaints or notices that they're given and um, it goes away for a little, t a little while and then probably comes back again. Um, we are, in, in our meetings, we are trying to, to raise the general awareness. We have, um, as Colleen said, 25 to 30 people who come regularly. Um, recently started Facebook and are getting people watching in on that, so uh, we're getting some more notifications out there and more way to contact people and, and get them on board. We're very lucky that we've got a couple of uh, young ladies who, when they're not too busy with studies and things, will on their own organise litter picking on some of the, the, um, some of the parks especially. And um, our Elephant Park is getting a lot of work done on it just now and quite a few of the residents with younger families are getting involved in that. So that's the next generation down again who are going to be, I planted that, don't make a mess of it. So um, as you say, there's, there's this lost generation in the middle um, and we need to work on those. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. Um, I now invite members to ask questions. I'll start with Councillor Markham. Thank you. And, and can I thank you all for 
spending so much time with us uh, this evening and sharing uh, your views. I think it really has to also uh, to be made quite clear that this is a borough-wide problem. Um, the issues and the comments that you've talked about, we hear every day across the borough. So this is why this issue is so important. I appreciate what you're saying. It seems to me, and I do have a specific question, but there are two key issues. One is information and education um, of all stakeholders, whether they be um, landlords or, or tenants or homeowners or businesses, or schools, such like. So a lot needs to be done there. And I certainly have been struck with what you were saying, David, about the effectiveness of this leaflet. The second one is obviously enforcement. Um, you've mentioned about CCTV. Uh, we've had presentations from officers who say just putting a CCTV camera up doesn't do anything. The key thing is to go through the bags to try and find if there's any information. Unfortunately, people now twig that, and there is no information. They go through the plastic bags. There are no envelopes. There's no names, no addresses. And the same thing applies with bigger bulk rubbish. They carefully go through everything. So just having a camera isn't actually the answer, but enforcement is a key issue. We know that London, and particularly Hillington, is a very diverse um, borough. People come from around the world. And you, David, were saying that for many people, English is not their first language. So I'd like your views as to whether a lot of the information and education that is produced um, should be in various languages. Mr. Buck? Um, I, I think the simple answer to that is I don't think it should be. Um, you know, last um, census, I think um, there were 107 different languages spoken in Hillingdon, um, which was the largest in the country. Um, I, I don't think it is a question of language, really. I think it is a question of impact. And I, I'm in, into pictograms, uh, which is why we develop this. You know, the fewer words, the better. Um, and you, know, you can make much more impact by something that's got... You know, the issue is the black bag. Um, the red is don't do it. Um, the camera is watch out. And the 400 pounds, people can read that. Um, they get a message. Um, so uh, uh, Mr. Poor can speak with uh, personal experience from in working in pay for 40 years. Yeah, sorry, when the council produced it, there's too many words. But do you, everybody, nobody got the time to come and read it. And this one can tell you half a mile away what it's what you've got to do. Mm -hmm. So you don't need all languages. You've got to produce something which it catches the eye. My 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 business is my general you know, my. Uh, what I do is my business. It's a business is to, to attract. Something you put it on the top of the shelf, it attracts. If you put it on the top of the floor, it doesn't attract. I tell you the other reason, if you want to attract at the bottom, put some brick on there. They, when they fall over, they say, oh, that's nice. They forget they, they have them hit over the brick. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the idea, to catch their eyes. Thank you. Chairman, could I, could I just yes, um, respond to the point that Councillor Markham said about education? As, um, a few years ago, uh, one of the officers in um, environmental health approached us in Hayes about the problem of scores on the doors. You remember they, it's now called something else, but uh, we had lots of premises in Hayes <coughs> that were getting naught and one, and the environmental health officers would keep going back and nagging them and encouraging them and threatening them with prosecution and things that improve for a bit and then they slide back again and um, what she suggested was could we organise some sort of workshop uh, where officers could come along and explain to traders you know, why the system exists and why it was in their business interests to actually improve and we held a session, it was hard work getting people there, but we held a session, we had about 20 people there, I think. Yeah, um, and the scores on the doors across the town went up. 
And I, I thought it was a really good example of um, the council reaching out to people um, and engaging with them in a meaningful way. Now, whether we could do something similar on litter and management of your trade refuse, um, I, think, I think we should try it, and we would certainly be willing to use our contacts um, in Hayes to um, perhaps do a pilot scheme and see, see if it works. Thank you. Councillor Markham, do you have a follow-up at all? No. Uh, Councillor Tuckwell? Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, again, thank you very much to all the, the uh, residents and witnesses that have uh, shared their experiences with us this evening. Um, I've got lots written down. Uh, I'm not going to go through it all just yet, but there's a, just a couple of points. Um, what, I, what I got as a sense was, you know, real sort of community spirit. You know, in terms of you really want your community to to look the best and feel the best. So I, I thank you for that. But my my point is, is that you've got this this poster that's gone out and it's gone around sort of commercial businesses, small businesses. What kind of response are you getting from business owners? I think that it's like the general public, you know, there are people who are positive who want to make the town better um, and others who couldn't care less. Um, so um, it's very difficult to gauge how much impact we're making. But um, I mean, one of the things when I first started doing this work in Hayes Town, which is 11 years ago now, um, it was, oh, you can't change anything in Hayes, you know, and that sort of attitude. And uh, We've never allowed that to continue. We say you can improve things, never give up. And, and you find you've got lots of allies uh, amongst the businesses um, when you say that. You know, so it's, it's about a bit of leadership, if you like. Um, um, so I, I think we do actually get a lot of support from... Uh, the businesses for what we're doing um, but we still need to do more Thank you. I, mm. um, I know the, the business are they're doing their best whatever they can do I know some of the business they don't do what the council wants I usually go and tell them look this is this is something you don't if I can if I see something doing they're doing it I go and approach them look, don't do it because this is not something you're supposed to be doing Right. Some people they listen, some they don't listen. Uh, what I want to, because every time, you know, maybe five years, four years, every shopkeeper changes. The new one comes in, he doesn't know what to do. So the council knows when the shop is empty, they know the shop is occupied now. So what they do is either within within seven days or within five six days they get the they get the council you know, tax, you know, the, um, the, the 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 uh, the business rates. Uh, it's sort of nice to, to let them know they've got to pay their rates as well, but it's nice to have something like do's and don'ts give it to the shop, the new shopkeeper as soon as he comes in. So at least he's aware of he's not doing something wrong. Otherwise, what he does something wrong without knowing it, he gets penalised. Mm -hmm. yep. So this is what actually we've been asking to produce something, so we, we you hand it over to us, we will give it to the shopkeeper, to all and the new ones. We usually, I usually do, if a new one comes in, we welcome to the town and good, wish you good luck. But the so same time, I can hand over the letter as well. If, I, if you give it to me, and then I can pass it on to them. That's what I, so yeah, there are some other things there, you know, the, the, for the, to keep the town clean. I remember, you know, when I was a child, I went to a camp with the army and the camp the army used to take me away for you know some temple community work and one of us has to stay back to clean the room there are probably 20 of us we didn't have the, any bed we have the floor on the goods used to go on the floor everybody has to roll up their beds and keep it tidy and the person who stays behind he wants to make sure everybody everything is in the old line the five or six the sit four or five they're straight in the line we have to put a string, and everything you know, with the room has to be clean. You have to keep, keep the room clean. The, you know the, the door underneath the, the hinges? The inspector comes in, he looks at them and there. That's a training for the school children. This is what we like to do. You know, when you get the children, give, so ask the teacher to show them how to do. You know, the, the teacher or the inspector go and tell them, that this is what you have to do. Make sure the children are learned. Now, when the children come to the town centre, we done this, that, 
the you know the uh, cleaner greener that one they they know they know that we don't have to put put the rubbish when the children picks up the rubbish the adults say oh children are picking up I shouldn't be doing this I remember that I learned from the children as well I used to walk from my home to my shop for six o'clock five sorry four o'clock in the morning I used to have the carry bag I pick up the every rubbish everything put in the carry bag and when they see that the bin I put in the bin loads of people have seen me doing it they stopped doing it my shop from my home to the shop it was all cleaner than the other shops at the other street mm -hmm. so this is something we have to teach or be somebody street champion we have to pick up some champion do this bit show to the public yep. thank yep. you Thank you. Councillor Tucker, do you have a follow-up to the residents? Or? I do, actually. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, as, as Councillor Markham said, you know, this, this is an issue which is, which is across the borough. Um, so what advice would you offer to other similar business groups who might be looking to do something similar to what you guys have done in, uh, in Hayes Town? I don't think there are that many business groups across the borough these days, actually. Um, the, unfortunately, the Hayes Town Business Forum, we understand, is the largest uh, business group in the borough now. Uh, Ricelip uh, Chamber, I don't think it exists anymore. East Coast uh, doesn't. I um, don't think there's anything in West Drayton. So um, Ricelip Manor still going, um, but not very active. So. Um, there aren't that many business groups, unfortunately. Uh, but I, I think the advice that you know, I, I sit on Mr. Poir's executive committee uh, as a cooperative member is, is just never give up. As I said, you know, get people of goodwill together, and then we can reinforce each other's attitudes, and we can begin to make a difference. But it's hard work. Uh, but um, yeah, we, we've, that's the best advice. I um, just never give up. <laughs> I just added to some. Um, I, I know it's very difficult, you know, for to form the, the any, you know, the any group. Um, every group you form, if you get the members, probably might be five or six. You know, you got the cashiers, you got the chapter other member. Hardly anybody does anything. It's only one or two people in the group of the work. And we have our our boundary like the town centre. Some of our, you know, they, they'll say they, they, some of the shopkeepers they, they change hand, they go somewhere else. I know one of our members. He went to the North Side Road, mm. and he asked for our, our help. And we asked him to look if you want to do something, you have to enroll some members. Now he enrolled some members, and we got, we have we went there, listened to him, and they want this, you know, the shop and you know, the shop, shop, shop and shop display they, so that they can't people used to park their car and they would go for a holiday for three or four weeks in front of the shop no customer can stop so we lobbied the council and we we won it mm, and they, the work is already started there now so that's how you can do probably when, if any if, if i hope not the, the shopkeeper lose uh, leave our place if somebody does go to another another the bar, another the town center in the borough I'm sure he can tell you, look, let's form the, you know, another group and we can get the help. I know um, Mike, um, Mike Lincoln, he, do, he does inform everybody. I think you should do an inspector, uh, David Knoll, he mentioned to some other people, you know, Hayes Town is doing very good. If you want any help, come and help. We come and, but nobody has come and asked us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bardia. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, Mr. Puar, you, um, you preempted exactly the point I was going to, to raise. The Council does have data on businesses, naturally, as a result of collecting business rates. And I, too, uh, was uh, wondering whether perhaps uh, the Council uh, could, could use that data to proactively write to businesses, not all businesses, but perhaps those in the areas where we're seeing uh, the, mo the, the most problem. And uh, just reminding them of their responsibilities and perhaps proactively asking them to fill out a simple form on the website. Please declare which company you use to dispose of your business waste and fill in within by this deadline. Um, and whilst I've got all of you here, I would be interested to hear your views as to whether you think something like that would be effective in terms of tackling uh, uh, business waste. And um, I also thought the point, I think it was uh, one of the ladies from Barnhill Ward raised about large signs 
Um, I, I also think you make a very pertinent point. Um, I know some of the signs probably aren't quite as large as they need to be in order to really hammer home the message. And I know that some people are becoming very, um, very proactive in clearing their rubbish of anything that could possibly identify them. But perhaps a large sign which says, do not fly tip, bags will be searched, um, might deter some people and make them think twice before they think about littering. Thank you very much. Sorry. Um, the question you asked, uh, sorry, I forgot now. They're so getting yeah, older. Website. Website. So, um, the web website, sorry. The business website. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I Once I had 82 members, and because of the road work, you know, when they started the, the town, town centre open movement, a lot of sh the, the shopkeeper, they they got angry with me because you know, they lost their business, and I didn't do anything for them. And I, we become up to it 60 now because they don't understand the you know the the technical the of the uh, of the internet and the, and the uh, business you know the uh, the website and if you if you if you ask me how many email every shopkeeper's got out of 60 only 30 got emails mm. yes mm. and if i send the email they don't read it mm. i have to go and speak to them or even give the letter to them they, they put the letter they haven't got the time to read so I have to explain and go and speak to them, because it's all the most of the independent traders are like my age, probably the you know maybe probably the, you know the new young generation, new young generation. But when they take over, yes, they will understand the internet and the website. But it's not the time yet in the Hayes town to ask anybody to go on the website and fill up that form. Mm -hmm. Mr. Buff, did you want to say? Yeah, what? That I, I was not going to be rude about Mr. Puar's age, but <laughs> there, we're both about the same age. Um, there are a lot of younger people opening businesses in Hayes, and so it is changing. Uh, but I, I think it is right that a lot of the businesses don't even have, because we we try to organise uh, workshops, free workshop on using social media to promote your business. And a lot of them aren't even on email. Um, they've got, all got mobile phones, uh, but they don't have websites. They're not on uh, Twitter or anything. So we're starting from a very low base. Um, and I suppose, again, it's uh, you know, the younger generation um, are definitely doing that. And I think what you've suggested could work with, with them. But collecting the subscriptions from the 60 members. You know, we've had this long debate of, oh, why don't people have standing orders oh, yeah. or direct debits or something? Um, they just don't. You know, so the only way you get the subscriptions is we go round and... Not even once. No. Not even <laughs> once. That's right, yeah. So, the so person who mentioned, you know, asked them to pay on the standing order, he hasn't, he hasn't paid that for two years. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> That's right. Did you have a follow-up? Uh, the focus is not so much on the method by which the um, these shopkeepers will be contacted. It's it's just the fact that they are contacted. So, for example, why could the, what would your views be on the council sending out a letter to the business saying, please fill this out, name the company that you use to dispose of your commercial waste, please reply by this, or uh, something. I mean, I, I, and, you know, these businesses, I appreciate they might not have email addresses, but they must be doing their HMRC self-assessment tax bills every January. They must be doing the electricity. They must be paying their electricity, their water, their, their business rates themselves. Um, they all seem to have very, very snazzy phones, much nicer phones than I do in Hayes Town Centre. <laughs> they do watch the WhatsApp. <laughs> Is there any comments you wish to make briefly before I go on to the next member? Or, okay. Councillor Sweeten. Thank you very much, Chair. Can I say thank you to all the contributors this evening? Um, there are many good ideas that have come from you, and I would very much um, like that the, the big sign saying, you know, no fly tipping um, is cascaded out throughout the borough. I get very frustrated when I see the little tiny things that are on lamp posts etc now the problem that i've got in my area and maybe usually in other areas is that we haven't got this forum of businesses to come forward to help with the fly tipping issue and we've also got you know you've got the residents association formed in the 
30s, was it? <laughs> um, we've got very few residents associations in certain parts of the borough. I mean, I'm part of one, but it is a tiny one for a very small area. Trying to get residents associations formed is very, very difficult. And I think, really, to get the education across, I don't know whether we can, as part of this review, try to encourage areas um, to bring together volunteers, people of interest, schools, to take the responsibility a little away from the council, because we've got to work as a partnership here. I mean, I, I think the work that, that the Haystown Partnership has done and is doing is, is absolutely wonderful, as well as the Residents Association. You're doing marvellous work. But it's trying to get that cascaded out to all areas of the borough. You have, for example, the Heathrow Villages area, where you've got such a turbulence of the population because of the first runway that was going to be in one area which affected, and now the other runway which is going to be in slightly a different area which has um, affected residents so I don't know whether David you could give any advice to other areas on the council in a way that we could I don't know join hands I think as a, as a borough because at the moment we've got individual groups doing wonderful things and coming up with all of the um, the problems and knowing that, doing their little bit in their area but the only way to really capture this is for all of us to join together in some way and you know I think the council being the council responsible for all the wards etc etc <coughs> needs to get the advice from people who are at the sharp end um, who have had some excellent results uh, I think there's, there's two levels to this really in, in terms of um, the businesses and then the wider community. Um, the, on the businesses, um, Mr. Puar mentioned Mike Langan. Some of you may know Mike Langan. He's the chairman of the Hillingdon Chamber of Commerce and he uh, has, was very supportive when we set up the Hayes uh, Forum. We had a long argument about why we didn't want to call it a chamber and we wanted to call it a forum, but Mike has been really supportive and he sits on the executive as well. So I think um, if the council were to approach the Hillington Chamber uh, of Commerce and say, you know, could you help get something going in West Drayton? Um, he, yeah, 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 usually in West Drayton goes... Yeah, go, and then I think um, you, would, you would get a... You, you would get a positive response. You know, um, in terms of the wider uh, community, um, I think that's a whole different ball game, really, in terms of uh, what resources would be needed to do it. Um, because you know, I think you'd need substantial resources to get something that was sustainable. Um, you know, we wouldn't want to set something up that was just a flash in the pan. Uh, so you'd, you know, the council would have to put resources into it and. Um, some councils have got community councils and ward councils and so on, uh, but you would need officer resources to make that work, which obviously that would be a matter for you as councillors to decide in relation to other spending priorities. I mean, I'd love to see it, but um, I think it's a bit unrealistic as things stand at the moment. Thank you, Councillor Sweeting. Do you have a follow-up? Um, well, let's get to the sharp end, shall we? Um, what do you think will be effective? Are we talking about fines, bigger fines? I know the £400 comes across as being quite a big one, but hey-ho, there are larger amounts of money that we could have on those. Um, but some councils, I think, do a sort of an advertising and shame situation where if people are caught, information on, on the incident um, is, is made um, very much a public document that these people have done this or this business has have done this. How do you feel about the actual sharp end of this? Any, any ideas please David? And I, I think you, I'm a carrot and stick person really. I think you need you know, the education that, uh, we talked about earlier. Mr Puhal said about starting with the children what we talked about with the businesses I think just enforcement and shaming people doesn't yeah. work on its own um, I, I'm quite in support of finding people as a last resort 
But my priority really is educating people, you know, bringing together people of goodwill with lots of good information is is the priority uh, as far as I concerned and I, th I think shaming people um, it doesn't really work. The council has these anti-social behaviour officers that um, you see outside Uxbridge Tube Station and we sometimes see in Hayes. I mean, they, they were meant to be doing some of this. The r reality is catching people is very difficult and so what you ended up with certainly in Hayes was these officers caught somebody putting their cigarette out um, when they dropped it on the ground and fined them for that. It just created a load of aggravation and ill will and didn't actually address the problem of littering or the thing I mentioned, the pigeon feeding. They never caught anybody doing that. So um, I, I'm, I'm more on the education side and good publicity um, you know, with hard-hitting posters and so on that we talked about. Thank you. I think Councillor Sweetin raised a very good point, and I think in order to ensure fairness and balance, I would ask that question to be uh, given to the residents in addition to yourself. So, yeah. Claire, Kevin, Colleen, Jane, do you have any comments on that, on how you view what the approach should be? Could you use your microphone? Sorry. Please? We don't suffer as on a scale as Hayes do with uh, fly tipping, and but we do. We sort of uh, have people dumping freezers and builders' rubble and stuff like that, but as soon as we contact the councillors, it's moved within, removed within 24 hours. Our biggest problem is the gating, where builders are now dumping stuff behind people's properties. And uh, I had a call from a lady today that she's had rubble dumped at the rear of her property. It's nothing to do with her. It was part of a roof, and obviously to do with the builder. So it's in Woodcroft. Um, so. This is, this is what we're coming across. I don't think there's anything <coughs> else. Um, maybe we ought to sort of have a, uh, you have street champions, maybe you also have waste yeah. champions. champions. And uh, that would be down to... Uh, uh, and on your swinometer of enforcement of education, which one would you lean towards? Um, mind you, has to start with education, hasn't it? And it all comes down to laziness and people just can't be bothered and the attitude is someone else will clear it. Uh, if I may uh, recount a memory, um, a friend was shopping um, in Uxbridge not long after all the work was done on Into or, or the Chimes or whichever one it was and she was just walking along, went up to a bin, put some r rubbish in and somebody popped out and said thank you very much, here's a £10 voucher for one of the local shops. Mm. <laughs> Something that different. kind of thing, um, perhaps occasionally, might get uh, the education side of it. Yeah. Going back to bulky waste, it is advertised in the Hillingdon people, so there's no excuse for people to dump people. I haven't got my Hillingdon people out, but there's no excuse for dumping bulky waste, is there? Again, don't read it. Mm. Yeah. Thank you very much. Claire, Kieran, would you like to say anything? Yeah, um, in terms of enforcement and education, just sort of spoke to mind something akin with like speed awareness courses. If you get caught dumping, you either get the fine or do you go on to a fly tip awareness <laughs> course of some description and maybe combine that with the you know cleaning up of areas as well. So well, this is the impact of what you you are doing. Let's help get someone else clear up as well. <laughs> and help. the cost of the council as well, in terms of how much it costs to clear it. Absolutely. I, I, I think the council put out skips every now and again um, for a, a free-for-all, but again, being publicised, and I know we have one over the Greenway, but it, it, it was just a skip there. There was no sort of information on it at all or, or anything like that. So it's sort of this rubbish amnesty. <laughs> Kieran, sorry, did you want to say yeah. something? Maybe they've skip, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I got it all wrong. <laughs> yeah, I, I think education. People, I'm not even sure that people are actually aware that dumping litter is illegal. You know, pe people, you know, m most people think it's just the norm. They could just, I mean, are people actually aware that dumping rubbish is illegal? I think about 70% of the people are not. And that's why they're doing it. So um, education in the first instance. But yeah, um, fines, heavy fines. I think 400 isn't enough actually. Have heavy fines. 
we'd go a long way. Okay. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, Councillor McGuana. Thank you. Um, I really like the initiative with the schools, which is the cleaner and greener haze, and I think that was really fantastic. Um, I was really curious to know about the posters that they designed and whether these posters were actually put up anywhere to celebrate their work, but also to send that message of education, starting with our children. Um, was that put out anywhere in Hayes? We actually used the whole picture, um, which we got put up in shop windows. Even Tesco's put it up, which uh, they don't usually put um, other people's material in their windows. So, so we did actually use the, not the individual placards, but that image. And we got it up in about 30 shops, I think. So it, it did make an impact, yes. Mm. And, uh, sorry, and also we, when we do the events, like you know the uh, carnival or some other events, we have a display board, and we put it on the display. We tell them, we tell the public that's what we're doing, and could you show it to the children as well? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mavis. Um, I, mean, I mean, multiple issues, um, uh, and, and all of us want to see a difference in some way. And I suppose I'm racking my brains around the different individual aspects. And, and the one that I know I've experienced quite a lot is um, when tenants change properties. Uh, they have to leave it unfurnished. Um, so often all the bits they don't want end up down the alleyway, here, there, etc., in, in similar spots, um, kind of every three to six months. Uh, and, and so it would be really useful, and we may not have the ideas in the room, but it, it, to get a real sense of how we feel this could, from your experience, be prevented or changed, or whether the education <coughs> kind of lies in, I know that landlords do play a role in that, but uh, as people are moving or as things are declared, when people go from A to B or change an address with the council, um, just how we, I don't know, an amnesty of the previous tenant stuff, or uh, it tends to be that the shops and the, the, the um, longer standing tenants tend to have to just report all these extra bits of furniture or half bits of furniture or whatever the current mice and rats are breeding in but um, rather than a proactive approach so we really value um, residents and, and other thoughts okay. Thank you Mr Brough I mean my perception I got, haven't got hard evidence on this but, uh, my perception is it's more the landlords who are dumping the mattresses you know with, when the tenancy changes not the tenants. Um, so I, I think from what we said earlier about uh, Mr. Puar's idea of using something with the business rates, you know, when the, um, the, um, the with the, uh, the, the when the when the rates go out, you know, the council tax, I should say, they, they know when there's been a change in tenancy. Uh, could we do something with landlords then? Um, because the residents, you know, they can have if they've got to chuck stuff out, they can use the free service. It's the it's the the landlords can't. So, um, how do we communicate with the landlord? So we got some method in another part of the council where that data is available, and then it could be linked up. Um, sorry. Um. That uh, you were talking about the land about on the because the, sh the flats above the shop. I don't have much problem in the town centre because they, I come up to but one or two occasions where the I seen the mattress, you know, the really old one, the in the street, the high street, and I tried to find out who it was, and I approached that person. I said, "You're not supposed to be putting that. It doesn't give give bad impression for the town centre." Oh, he said, "There will be only for a like few hours." And I think for the next day or two, or two days after that, they were gone because he knew I was going to report them. I think that's what the, you know, that's what I'm asking for the champion, street champion. They can approach the person. Look, it's not it doesn't look nice. And once once they know he's somebody's talking, even though not official, but they think somebody will listen to him. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mavis. Do you have a follow-up you wish to ask? Okay. I invite the residents if they wish to say anything. Um, I mean, other than CCTV, and CCTV is only as good as the person sat viewing it, absolutely. Um, I mean, there was a initiative, I remember, on refuse trucks years ago about, you know, sort of spilling the beans on a benefit fraud or what have you, it's something similar maybe for fly tipping and, and waste, maybe, you know, in areas where there are problems, cleaning up then targets. 
um, residents with leaflets, etc. People are out going wild on leafleting, but um, and get messages out to those who, you know, what is the benefit for someone to, to ring the council and say, well, there goes another mattress again, or, you know, round you come, because it, it is a free service. Mm. <laughs> you know, they've mm. we've got this sort of downward spiral a little bit. It's, you know, we've got to get residents to take pride in what they've got, and um, and often in, in these situations, they they are just fleeting. They're there for three, six months, and they're, they're gone. Um, you know, and there's no way of, of tracking them, really, necessarily. So, yeah, I don't know. Thank you. I don't think many people are aware of this free service. I'm not people sure that people actually read Hillingdon people. Yep. So I, I think people need to be more aware that the, this free service does exist. Yep. So there are bulky items. So I mean, I, one of my neighbours were moving out and they put all their furniture outside. And I said to them, do you know there's a free service that takes it away? And they said no. And I, had to give them the, I went to give them the number. Yep. So I think more people need to be aware of yep. this free service. I think people that are fly tipping and are not necessarily caring mm -hmm. if there is a free service or not. They've got a free service by just putting it out there. So <laughs> it, it just goes a long way about it. Um, so it's just trying to cut that part down um, and getting that person to report their own waste first. Thank you. Anyone from Offer would like to comment? Put the microphone, please. <laughs> Issues with fly tipping, we report either it comes through to me as chair or we and then I report it to the councillors to uh, Councillor Wayne Bridges and it's dealt with within 24 hours taking photographs and we've had all sorts of things chairs dumped and fr a freezer and I think it's mainly the builders that do the dumping uh, but that's <coughs> I, I can't prove that thank you um, Councillor Rodriguez I can the sorry uh, I would like to ask a question to Mr. Dave. Is about the school children. How do you get this organization for the school teachers and children go and collect the rubbish? Because of any time we try to go to school, though, they say it's the health and safety, so they don't let the kids come out to collect the rubbish. So I would like to know how do you get those kids? to go and collect because it's so difficult for us in our schools to... Thank you. It is very challenging. As I said in my opening comments, I think it very much depends on having a committed teacher. We were very lucky in Hayes. Um, in the case of Botwell, we had this, this fantastic uh, Kiwi guy from New Zealand. Um, he, yeah, he, was, he was brilliant. And... Um, he overcame all the, those sort of negative things because you know we gave the children um, proper litter pickers and uh, we gave them uh, high vis uh, jackets um, and the Botwell House um, have actually got eco warriors. You know that's, uh, that some of their kids um, are so passionate about this they they call themselves eco warriors. Um, so you know I think if you get the right person in the school and um, the commitment uh, you can overcome it and, and the enthusiasm that we got um, from the children was fantastic and um, you know people were saying to us oh that's very good that you're training these children um, we said actually we're not you know the, it's the children who will be training the adults um, and you get that message across to them and they do become uh, you know advocates to get the older generation like kids stopping their parents smoking uh, a few years ago you know that you, the same sort of thing so it can be done uh, don't, don't, don't accept no for an answer is the advice I think <laughs> thank you thank you yeah, sorry just another thing is but is any problems for the parents the, the parents needs to know the kids they go and they do, do this on the road because like I said health and safety. They, I know they always look after this, the health and safety. So is the children uh, allowed to go out to the road to do this kind of things? Yes, uh, uh, some, you know, each 
time they go out, it's the responsibility of the staff to do a risk assessment. Um, and as long as they've done that, and then they take the necessary action, you know, like having high vis jackets and having enough supervisors so that the children aren't running all over the place. Um, it is, you know, I think, unfortunately, you know, I'm a great believer in health and safety, but I, I, I think it sometimes has gone too far in terms of stopping schools doing things, and you, you take away that um, excitement. And I mean, the kids who were out doing that demo in the town centre, they'll remember that, and that will be with them for a long time. Um, and you know, let's do more of it. Don't don't use health and safety as a excuse to keep people locked up. Thank I you, remember my one. Mrs. Mrs. Only Sorry, Mr. Uh, Pua, I've got Mrs. Turnbull Sorry. wanting to say to speak first. Sorry. May I just add that um, any time children are taken out of school, a letter goes home to the parents for their permission. So if parents were worried and didn't want it, they could say, "No, my little Johnny's not going," and the school will make. Um, a provision for that, but any time they go out, even for um, a timetabled swimming lesson, there has to be parental permission for the child to leave the school. Thank you, Mr. Okay. Yeah, um, that's what I said, you know, I said, you know, when the child learns anything, I mean, I was an 11 year old, I'm 76, and I still remember what I'd done. <laughs> so it goes into the brain, you know, it becomes a, late, a picture in the brain, it reflects every time you do something. So it started from the childhood. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, all members around the table have asked at least one question in the supplementary. I don't believe there's any more wishing to ask questions, so we'll go back to previous ones who have asked questions. Councillor Sweeten. Um, you will note in the papers before us that in December, the Cabinet will be considering the Local Plan Part 2, and it will finally get its <coughs> stamp, hopefully. But what it will mean is that certain areas of the borough, West Drayton, um, Usley and Hayes, will become not only they will become urban rather than suburban areas. That has implications concerning the density of new development. So I would be interested in what David might say about what the council possibly will need to do to ensure that these very highly dense developments um, are going to have the requisite, um, if you like, information give provided to the residents that we're not going to be building up a, a yet another heap of rubbish going into those areas that are already affected very much by high density housing and houses of multiple occupation. So I do think um, your views on, on what the council can do to, to help areas such as usually West Street and, and Hayes when this um, local plan is finally implemented. I think in terms of the new developments, um, by and large their arrangements for rubbish management and disposal are better than what we had before. Um, you look at the blocks that are being built in Hayes, you know, as part of the planning process. Uh, they've got to have proper systems in place um, for where they store the rubbish and um, it's, it's got to be easily accessible for lorries and so on. And the, this Bolin Court that I mentioned earlier is an example of how not to do it mm -hmm. uh, because that's an older development, you know, where the rubbish was supposed to be put in bin stores at the back and there was no rear access from the property and people were supposed to go down a dark alley uh, to put their rubbish out. So it's not surprising that they <coughs> don't do that. So I, I, I don't worry about that particularly. I, I think the houses in multiple occupation uh, that's happening all over is, is a bigger problem in terms of, uh, uh, of the rubbish because it, it's very much it's quick turnover, as you said. Uh, people don't have pride in the area and um, landlords um, get the rent, um, they're not too interested in what's going on. Um, so it, it, I would be more worried about increasing the numbers of houses in multiple occupation than in more, I mean there are, there are other worries about blocks of flats, you know, which the impact on the local health services, uh, whether there's enough children's play areas, those sorts of issues uh, which I 
I'm concerned about in Hayes, uh, but not not the rubbish issue. Thank you, Councillor Sweeting. Do you have a, a follow-up? Yes, from the little to the sorry, from the large to the little. Um, many of the residents um, that I deal with keep on telling me about the overflowing bins, and there's the issue of is the bin of sufficient capacity to take the rubbish that's in it. And your views on whether the size of the bins is an issue, please. Because um, one of the people that I'd hoped would be um, um, giving evidence would be one that has reported to me probably a hundred times on overflowing bins, especially near park um, areas, of, um, grass, green areas, or recreation grounds, etc. So what is your view about the size of the bins, please? Councillor Sweeting, for clarity, is that a question to Mr. Brough or an open oh, question? Well, generally, okay. yeah. if you can answer it. briefly, that would be appreciated. Yeah, um, I think my answer would be ask the street sweepers, um, because the guy in Hayes who I talk to, uh, he thinks the bins are not big enough, and he, you know, he has the job of clearing. I mean, he's fantastic uh, what he does. You know, he leaves the place pristine. And then he comes back the following morning and starts all over again. I think he's, he's got, his morale is amazing. He says the bins are not big enough. But it would be interesting if, if you follow up that um, research uh, that I mentioned with uh, Brunel and, and, and Sussex universities, um, whether that came up um, with, with their people. But I think it's, also, it's a question of size of bin, number of bins and frequency of Thanks. emptying. So outside Hayes and Harlington Station, for example, um, that is exactly the situation you described. Uh, the, the street sweeper says the bin's not big enough, um, but it may be frequency of emptying is the answer. Thank you. Are there any other witnesses wishing to comment? Okay. Councillor Markham? Uh, no, that's your chance. So. Okay. Um, in that case, I think we've asked most of the questions this evening that we could ask. I, I will say one more thing, actually, on top of what's been asked already. In your presentations, there wasn't much mention of foxes, and it seems to be quite a, an issue in the ward that I represent. I'm just wondering if you have any views on that uh, and what the council could possibly do to improve that open question, whoever wishes to comment. Claire? Yes, yeah, foxes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think... I like foxes, <laughs> they're quite cute. But the rats are obviously a problem, but yeah, foxes, and again, it's you know, not putting litter into hard, solid bins, they just tear it apart, and it comes apart, and then you're mixed in with children's nappies and, and everything else. I mean, the aroma over the summer months was quite spectacular <laughs> at times, and I really feel for the guys that have to come and and collect it as well but yeah no we have families of foxes as well living amongst us thank you Mr. Um, I remember you know the, the foxes and the g rats they usually come for the food or something mm -hmm. yes um, you know the takeaway shops they have the paper bags some little boxes and they, 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 they everything eat something they put it on the uh, they throw it on the on the floor some only few people put them in the bin and that's where the rats and the foxes come to I don't know whether I'm right or wrong. A long time ago, I I think it's my imagination. When somebody takes over at you know takeaway shops, they have the duty of care. Going in the morning, half a mile, pick up their own rubbish. You know anything that belongs to their shop. Mm -hmm. I'm not right. I'm I'm not sure whether it was the council or is they were doing themselves. Mm -hmm. So if you can create something like that, when they get this, they come into the shop. They have half an hour in the morning. They could they send somebody else to pick up their own rubbish to, which belongs to them. Mm -hmm. So that will probably stop. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Turnbull, are you indicating? Uh, urban foxes, I, I think, are a fact of life. And as Claire has said, we just have to make sure we don't make it too easy for them and they'll go and look for the easy option somewhere else. So one of the difficult things for them would be the food waste bin. So obviously encouraging more people to sign up to that would be... Uh, a good way forward. Knowledge and say, even putting two bricks on top of my food base bin, the fox managed to turn it over. So, uh, you need a ton weight. We need to have the Hillingdon hunt. It's <laughs> <laughs> a bit controversial. <laughs> controversial, <laughs> that. One, one, okay. 
Um, there's a there's a block of flats which I sit on the committee there, and I own some of those. When we sit on how to how to stop the rats coming into the upper place, um, we have the, we used to, you know when the uh, the builders they you know the contractors they built build those flats, they given us a little hut and it was empty from there. People used to put the rubbish from the top, and also the residents put the rubbish from standing there to put the rubbish there, and it splits open, and that's where it, 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 it encouraged the, uh, the rat to come in. So we put the, the roof on the top, and when the rats were, they, even the rats were still coming out, the, the fruits, the, the food is still spread over, so they were coming from outside, dig up the ground, and come into there. We put the, the concrete, it still was coming. We supplied them the plastic, you know, the wheelie wheel bins. Now what happened there, the, you know, the, the rats were so big and they're so strong, they chew the top and jump into that. <laughs> and what happened there, when the bin is empty, they can't jump out. So they die inside. <laughs> Well, uh, so, uh, on that note, <laughs> <laughs> can I just say a very big thank you to you all on behalf of this committee, and not only for your presentations, but also the feedback and potential recommendations we can have. I've sat on a number of committees, uh, both past and present, and one of the issues we always have is that we get good presentations, but not enough sort of recommendations from it, and you've really helped us tonight, and it's much appreciated. So thank you very much. I'm sure you'd like to stay throughout the entire meeting, but if you wish to go, you're free to do so. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Um, as we have taken up quite a lot this evening on this one item, I would um, kindly request officers to keep their presentations brief on the basis members have read the reports. Uh, and we can focus then on the questions a lot more on that basis. Uh, so we move on to the annual complaints. Uh, welcome to you, Ian. You may sit wherever you like, yeah. It's the second time I've seen you this week. <laughs> Whenever you're ready. Okay. Yes, unfortunately, Councillor Bridges has heard some of this already before. Sorry. Um, just to give you an overview of the uh, complaint position, I think the page 17 probably is probably a good starting point really because it provides you with a with a table which provides the how Hillingdon uh, is performing summary is that complaints as a whole when you compare last year with this year there's not a dramatic change between between the two two years it's pretty much static uh, the number of compliments now one admission I need to make is that the total number of compliments which is in the bottom corner of that table, which says 54 isn't wrong. It should actually be 142. So 142 compliments for 2017-18, but it has significantly risen to 234 for 2018-19. And I think that's more to do with the publicity across the council. Um, after the last uh, POC, which you were present with, I actually went back and had a look whether we received any compliments from councillors. Actually, we did. Quite a few, actually. Uh, so we are capturing those compliments and they are coming through. Um, my anticipation for the year to come will that there will be a significant rise further in terms of the number of compliments, only because I think people are, uh, staff are much more astute now and they're sending that through. Um, the, there are two things that I think I'd like to just bring to your attention, really, and to highlight. One is that in my report I've provided you with a reference to an ombudsman investigation where the ombudsman uh, issued a public report. That is quite important actually. Very uh, Public reports are issued where the ombudsman believes that the council has not complied fully with all the things that we, it expects it to do. This case was to do with a housing benefit claimant. What happened was um, she she had a change of circumstances, she moved address. We didn't update our records and we continued to pay her as benefit. There should have been a reassessment and a change and we just continued to pay her. So of course after a while uh, a volume, uh, a, num a number of, uh, an amount of compensation occurred because she, uh, she was being paid when she wasn't entitled to it. It related to about a thousand pounds we wrote to her, asked for it to be paid back, 
And then things got even worse because the handling of the actual complaint was poor. The handling of the communication between her and the council wasn't great. She had some disability issues, and I think what she was asking for is a point of contact. We got it wrong. We gave her a mailbox. Unfortunately, there are some cases where one problem follows another. This was it. And what happened was the Ombudsman looked at it and they made a whole series of recommendations and I think I've enclosed, uh, I've mentioned some of them. We accepted all of them and we complied with all the recommendations made by the Ombudsman. There's a fair bit of learning that needs to take place as well, um, which we've now taken forward. The only sort of thing I would say to you in mitigation, which really is a mitigation, but it is mitigation in a sense that when the, um, when the, when the council deals with housing benefit claimants, uh, we deal with something like 17,000 claims, and in total about 139 million. We got this one wrong, and we got it badly wrong. But it just you know, put, puts into context the things that we do get right. Um, the other thing that I thought you... I ought to mention really I suppose is th this committee covers education and I'll provide you with a flavour of the type of education complaints that we get. So we had 20 informal complaints for, uh, for education services. We had 32 formal complaints and that was one less than the year before which is 33. The, the time taken to respond to education complaints is an issue because we have a time target of 10 working days and for Last year, only 78%, so 78% of 32 was responded to within the 10 working day target. But there is an anomaly in the way that education services um, complaints are dealt with. A lot of them require input from the school. And where we, where we have difficulty sometimes is when the school closes. So, for example, if the school closes during any of the times uh, for half term, we can't get the information, we can't provide the response. And what then happens is we miss the target. So in, in a sense that the performance has gone down, but I, I, I think the, the important thing is, is, to, is the number of upheld complaints is actually very few. All these complaints that we deal with, the complainant has the right to go to the ombudsman should they wish to, and the total number of ombudsman investigations last year for the whole of the organisation, for the whole of the council, was 85 in total and of those, 10 were upheld. So it's quite a good strike rate, really, in terms of how, how what we do. Um, the, the other thing I just want to sort of point out to you, I think, is on um, page, I think on page 17, sorry, page 20. There are two things on that page, and I think you might be interested in though, and funny enough, it follows on from the discussion you've just had. The members' inquiries, for last year was 11,308 in total submitted. And that's a significant jump, 37%, I think, from the year before, which was 8,110. But there's one service that dwarfs everything, and it's just waste. Waste is literally, I would say, half of all the, the, the members' inquiries that comes in. Um, the, the thing about waste um, is that it's quite, a lot of it is quite easy to do. It's a bit like what you've talked about. There's a rubbish there and you, you bring it in, we go and collect it, sort it, and it's dealt with from in that respect. But there are others which are more tricky. So social care, for example, get very few members' inquiries, but they're harder to deal with. They take time. There are some entrenched views sometimes that can't be changed. So those things require more attention. But the volume is definitely in resident services, definitely in, um, in um, waste services. The other thing above that, you'll see that uh, I provide you with a table of adult social care um, uh, complaints and also children's services complaints against how our sort of neighbouring boroughs do. I think in the previous um, committee that I was before, we had a discussion as to what uh, what amounts to a neighbouring borough. But these are the ones that, um, that we've got data on. And actually, as a whole, it shows that this council as a whole has generally fewer complaints than others um, that, you know, when we compare it. So I think uh, that's probably all I really ought to say, bearing in mind, and I'm very happy to deal with any questions that you've got. Thank you very much, Ian, for your brief presentation. I'll put out to questions. Councillor Markham. 
Thank you. And thanks very much, Ian, for the, the, the report. I just want to major on members' inquiries. Yep. Um, and particularly officer time that is spent. Uh, to me, the clue is in the name member inquiries. From what you've been saying, 80% of the emails that councillors send in are really reporting things like waste. Um, and there are very few inquiries. And I wondered whether it's not in future possible to break those down. And indeed, can there not be a separate email address that councillors can use for just reporting things which do not require an answer? Here again, to try and save officer time in order they can concentrate on the more important inquiries. So it's the actual numbers. Let's separate member reports and members' inquiries. It's actually quite a hard thing to do that because um, all that happens is when, a, when an inquiry comes in, it's recorded exactly the same way, whether it's an inquiry or a report. Uh, but actually, the, the bulk of the inquiries are actually via the telephone, so you get an awful lot of inquiries which come through in that way. From, sorry, uh, sorry, from councillors? Yes. Um, what... What I can try and do is, after this meeting, I'll try and go away and work out whether there's a way of showing that. Um, because the, the, the inquiries can be, the waste service inquiries will generally be a report saying, can you go and collect that because it's there. So you could sort of say that's fairly straightforward. But there are others which the councillors ring in which are tricky, uh, and they could be on the resident services. It could be a planning issue or it could be a housing issue, which take a bit more time. So whether it can be broken down, I'm not quite sure, but I, I will have a look and see if it's possible to do it in that way. Thank you. Councillor Sweetham. Thank you very much, and thank you for the detailed report that you've provided, Ian. Um, I'd like to bring um, up something which is mentioned on page 16, which is remedies for redress, yes. reconsidering an incorrect decision. Now, um, I know that this is a possibility for councils, but how can a council be unbiased um, and be able to consider properly a complaint when dealing, for example, with a planning application which had been submitted by the council and considered by a committee of the council? Because I know that you were involved in a very large complaint that a lot of people had put in. Um, and the response back was, well, the committee has just um, considered it and it's all fine. And actually that complaint, I think, should have been upheld because in the end it emerged that the application was indeed flawed. So coming back to that particular um, issue is when a council puts in, when this council puts in a planning application or something and a committee... Um, considers that application and then there is a complaint about that, how can the council deal with it in an unbiased way? Funny enough, that question is raised quite regularly from complainants, not specifically about planning. The, um, some complainants hold the view that uh, an internal complaint service can't be independent because it's an internal in investigation. But the strange thing I would say to you is that the volume of upheld complaints for example, um, you've got something like, um, for last year, for example, you had 837 uh, complaints that were, that were entirely that were processed at stage one. There will be a high proportion of those that we actually uphold in terms of we say, actually, we've got it wrong, this is what we need to do, and we, we, we sort it out from that. But the, the thing I would say about that planning element is that when it, what the council is required to do is to look at the, the information that's presented. So an officer at a senior level will look at it and they will provide their decision based on whatever the evidence they've based on. If someone's not happy with the decision that the council's made, then their recourse is to the ombudsman who is independent to review. So that option will always be um, we open to, to that person if they so wish. And actually, four years ago, it was not this committee... But, the, um, but another committee in which we reviewed the council's corporate complaints procedure. And part of that procedure was a number of changes we made, but one of the changes that we made was that for those complainants who felt that the council either 
couldn't provide them with, with the response that they're looking for or they're unhappy with the decision, we allowed them to go directly from stage one straight to the ombudsman. So you then immediately got an impartial view of uh, the, the decision the councils made. And actually, when you look at the ombudsman's decisions, in t when they looked at the 85, for example, for last year, only 10 of those were actually upheld. And the council would have upheld those in the first place as well. because it's So there is, there is steps that people can follow in which if they're not happy with what the council's done. And you're right, there are, there are people who tell me and people who write saying, well, how can the council's internal procedure be independent? But we have to start somewhere, and we do have to have a system in place which we can deal with those things. Um, and I tell you, we do find an awful lot um, where we've found we've made a mistake. We do hold a hand up, and Dan here is one of the senior managers, who will say, you know, actually, we've got it wrong. What can we do to put it right? In terms of the planning, though, planning is tricky because there are some things within planning that the complaint process isn't their option, but actually it, it needs to go directly to either a tribunal or, or an inspectorate that needs to consider it. So it needs to go separately to a different process that needs to be followed. I can't remember the specific ones you're remembering, but that's probably the route it probably needs to go to. Do you have a follow-up, Councillor Sweetie? Um something completely different actually and that is um, we've got information here on um, children's services and it says that there's a need to improve um, could you provide information on what is done uh, what is being done to improve that service please yeah. um, that's page 19 um, let's just find the right page um, it says oh. children's services uh, yeah. complaints responded to within an area for improvement. Yeah, it's like, it actually applies to a number of areas, but it's the same thing, and it applies to um, <coughs> to education services that I've just mentioned before. The 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 council is required to respond to complaints within a set time frame for children's services. At stage one, it's ten working days, as it is for uh, other areas, and one area where children where I've, um, mentioning is that 76% of the 42 children's services complaints were responded with in target, so 24% are not. So essentially one in four is failing to meet the target, and that's not good enough, and that's the thing that we need to improve on. Um, and what we've been doing is I've been meeting with the um, heads of service to actually try and... What people tend to do is when they get a complaint, rather than deal with it immediately and start to gather the evidence and investigate, it's left to later on in the process, so day seven. But the problem with doing that is it's too late because the investigatory work that you needed to have done needed to have done quickly. Because with a children's complaint, it's not straightforward. They can involve possibly a discussion or a meeting. Um, and what I've been saying to people is you need to get in at day one, otherwise you're going to miss that target. And we've got a target for a reason to actually try and achieve. So that's the reason for that. Thank you very much, Councillor Tuckwell. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, all for celebrating success. Um, and so, when it comes to the compliments, what's the feedback loop um, for for the compliments that we receive? And, and is there a method of recognition for individual contribution when it's appropriate? Um, yes. The, what happens is the. The, when a compliment's received, I get it, but equally uh, it will also go to their manager, the heads of service. And what, uh, what, they've, what they do in children's services, but I haven't seen across other services, is the heads of service actually writes to whoever it is and says, well done, you know, really pleased to see that. Or it's an email which says, you know, really pleased to read what you've achieved and it's, it, you know, the significant contribu contribution you've actually made. So that tends to go down well. We also have awards for employees in terms of uh, where someone has done an exceptional job there and then awarded something, you know, it, it's either financial or just a thank you. So we do have it in different ways uh, to actually award someone. But what I what I wanted to say, I suppose, on a, which I didn't do about compliments, is uh, when I look at a compliment, I I want to be quite. Um, I don't record everything as a compliment because if someone's just done their job, that's not a compliment. That's just doing your job. So it has to be someone who's gone that extra mile and someone's recognised it. 
Um, and so those are the ones that are recorded. So potentially there's a lot more compliments than what I've recorded, but only because I think it has to be someone who's gone beyond that, beyond their normal duties and gone out their way to help someone, and those are the ones that are recorded um, as compliments. But yes, there are sort of... I think it means more, and the majority of them are ones where the heads of service will just write to someone and say, look, really pleased, well done to do that. But those which are exceptional tend to go on to the employee um, recognition sort of scheme. We do also give com uh, compliments to the, um, the, uh, co the communications team, and what they do is in the staff roadshow, some of the compliments are then picked out and put into the staff roadshow as well. So we do have different ways of doing it. Thank you. Councillor McGuana. Thank you. Just following on from the idea of compliments, um, are these shared anywhere else, like such as on the website perhaps? No. Uh, it's not secret, it's just we don't share it anywhere else. It tends to stay internally, I suppose. Uh, we've not done that, no. But I can, I can suggest that and see yeah. what's said. On a smaller scale, though, this is in the public domain, so the minutes and the agendas will all be available in public. Um, Councillor Bardia. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you for your presentation. I appreciate you don't have the easiest job in the Council. Um, from your uh, report pack, I understand that people can make a complaint by telephone, and I was wondering whether implicitly this would mean that any any member of, of the council that answers the telephone would be trained in terms of how to recognise a complaint and the procedures uh, which to follow in that instance? It's, that's quite tricky. Um, what happens is I, I run quarterly um, training events for all staff, so if, if they believe that their staff needs to be trained in a particular way, then I'm, they're very happy to attend a training course that I run. Uh, usually that covers about 20 to 30 people a quarter, so that's not huge numbers. But I think the contact centre generally get the majority of the complaints that come in, and what their staff have, uh, have been trained to do is to try and identify what the issue is, and if it happens to be something which they feel can't be dealt with, then it will come through to my team and it's then that they get the expert advice in terms of how the complaint ought to be processed. Because what happens with each step of the complaint process is that there is an informal stage. So at an informal stage, any member of staff can deal with it, um, and they can try and answer the question and, and try and progress it as much as they can. Because a lot of the time, when someone says they're, they're dissatisfied, the resolution doesn't actually sit in my team. The resolution actually sits with the managers of the teams and the services that they that they provide the service to. And my advice often is, let's take your details, let's see if it can be resolved informally by you know, giving them the information and seeing if it can be done. And actually an awful lot of complaints in, at an informal stage are actually dealt with uh, through the informal complaint process. But I guess your question is, does everyone know the complaint process? The answer probably is no. But I think we've, we've got sufficient coverage where people, if they're dissatisfied, that uh, they know where to send the, send the person to and transfer it to. And, you know, my team do get an awful lot of uh, complaints where we deal with um, verbally, and they do come through. Um, a lot of the time when I speak to people, and my team speak to people when they want to make a complaint, sometimes it's just they want to get something off their chest. Sometimes it's just they don't actually want to complain. They just want their, whatever their issue is sorted out. So it could be that there is a, a mattress in front in their garden being dumped they just want someone to come and collect it. It's, there's an awful lot of those things that come through, and actually they're quite easy to do, so all we would simply do is take their details, pass it on to the relevant people, uh, and deal with it from there. But the other point I would make is that the council's quite, well, it is a big place, and people, when they look at the website, they don't actually know who to go to to get, us, to get it sorted, and sometimes the easiest thing to do is ring the complaints team up, because we'll find out, and I would say to you an awful lot is that, people ringing up saying, look, actually, we want to do X, Y, and Z, um, but how, you know, who, do we, who do we contact, or can you do this for us? Um, and often that's the easy thing to do. We take it, we deal with it. Um, we do get some of the trickier complaints that come through verbally. Um, they would be few, but in the last year, I would say we probably had five, 
verbal complaints, um, historic allegations of sexual abuse, usually you know, relating some time back, um, adult social care where you'll get issues about um, possibly care homes sometimes where p potential abuse has taken place. Um, we do get some for the housing area where people complain about the sheer the accom accommodation that they're staying in. Um, so those are the more harder ones to s unravel where there are more issues and we do take those verbal complaints. Um, we do come across people who have no means of communicating other than verbally so it, it's sort of progressing it in that way. Um, but yeah, verbal complaint is really important but I often find that they're, they're not really a complaint, they're just someone mm. just asking for help and it's fairly, most of it is fairly straightforward. Thank you. Do you have a follow-up, Council Guardian? Notwithstanding um, what you've just told us, the informal complaints did rise by over 10% between 2018-2019 um, 2018, 2018, uh, to 2017-2018, and I was wondering if you have any idea as to what reasons might be behind that rise. Can you use your mic, please, Ian? Ian. Sorry, it's actually gone down by actually about uh, 200 odd. Um, the, 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 the strange no, no, the, the, no. But the strange answer is actually the weather. The weather dictates in many ways um, the volume of informal stuff that we get. It's about the cutting of the grass. It's often a, in, in, if it's if it's raining, it's the the puddles and the. So it, it the weather actually plays a significant part in in terms of the the volume of complaints and informal stuff that we actually um, get. Um, so I think we've had quite a mild winter last year, and if we have another one, then hopefully it might go down even more. Um, but, but it is strange. It is the weather that plays a big part in... Yeah. Thank you, Thank you very much. Council Members? Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to look at, at the Table 5 um, with the uh, Ombudsman investigations. Um, the comparisons are extremely helpful. Um, it, I suppose the, the thing to note for me is that, you know, uh, although we have a, a lower total number of stage one complaints, we do have the highest numbers in both tables of, um, of uh, investigations. Um, and we're talking small differences, but we, we are there in that. Um, the, the one that intrigued me most was that in terms of um, adult social care, Hillingdon, where the other um, boroughs mentioned, have less than 10% um, going to investigation. Ours is nearly a quarter. And I wondered if, there was, if that's a usual year-to-year -year sort of percentage, or if actually it's been a particularly difficult year in terms of um, things, whether they're upheld or not, because not many are, but moving towards the Ombudsman in adult social care. Yeah, it's uh, funny enough, this, this, another committee asked the same question, or a similar question. The the issue actually isn't um, is, is fairly straightforward. What happens is that it takes the ombudsman between six to nine months to investigate a complaint. So, for example, if a complaint feeds through in 2016, the ombudsman may only conclude the investigation in 2018. So you could have a, a huge time lag between between one and the other. So what you end up with is complaints cross over different years. So sometimes, what, for example, if you look at the uh, the, the adult social care, you've got 40 complaints that were concluded by us in 2018-19, um, uh, but nine of those, but a proportion of those nine will be the year before. So it then feeds in, so it, look, it makes it look worse than it actually is. Uh, but it, it's just the sheer time scale that, it, that, that sort of takes place. And the same thing would, would actually apply for the children's services as well. So it, 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 it makes it look as if proportionately we've had more than others. But if I provided you with the data for the year before, you'll find that the actual number of um, um, ombudsman investigations will be lower because it's just, it just crosses over from one year to the other. Thank you, Council Members. Do you have a follow-up? I think it would be useful to get a year-on-year -year comparison, yes. particularly in these two areas where these are more complicated, generally more complicated complaints around specific things. Um, so it would be useful to make sure that we're doing all we can to... 
um, to make sure that number's declining. Happy to add that as an action point in the minutes. Uh, can I just, one thing I just add on these ombudsman investigations, you're absolutely right, I mean, there are some investigations that, I mean, one of them that's included in there took two years to resolve uh, in, in terms of the ombudsman investigation. What happens with each investigation that the ombudsman does, and actually what the council does as well, is that when a complaint at a formal stage is investigated or the ombudsman investigate, once we've got the decision, so whatever decision we've reached in terms of what happens is, there is a learning element that follows on. So from each complaint, there is, uh, we have to identify what the learning is and act upon that. If it's to do with the ombudsman, we actually have to tell them what we've done. So there is, there is an awful lot of learning that takes place as a result of uh, any upheld complaints whether it's internal or external, that we, that we have to do. Uh, and that's expected of us, really. Um, but I'm happy to provide the comparison. Thank you. I believe we've got one last question from Councillor Markham. Ian, it's been, Excuse me, Ian, it's been fascinating listening um, to what you've been talking about, particularly the sort of complaints that you have to deal with and how you deal with them. Um, can I just go back to members' inquiries? Would it be possible for you to let us have a list of how many MEs have come from particular wards and do it alphabetically? It's not a prize-giving situation. It would just be useful because that might very well help us identify wards which may have particular problems. Um, it's really easy to do. Um, it's, yeah, it's really easy to do. And um, for, for the last two years, were you thinking of? Um, I would have to get clearance of it from my uh, senior manager, but it's, it's fairly straightforward to do. But I'm happy to provide that. But I would need to speak to my manager. Just Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm cautious time's marching on, so we'll finish off with Councillor Sweetin now. Thank you. Um, on page 24, there's a complaint reference 6810892, which the Ombudsman did not investigate. I'm just quickly reading the information on that. Um, I think it seems rather strange that the Ombudsman didn't investigate because there would appear to have been some element of fault there. So I wonder whether you could provide any further information on that one. Yeah, it's um, it's a funny term the ombudsman used. Did not investigate, it, and it is because the reality is they have investigated it. They have looked into it. They because what happens is when an ombudsman investigates a complaint, we have to send all the paperwork to them. So all the paperwork that we would have considered at our stages, and they will look at that. But then they come back and say, well, did not. In, they, they will say did not investigate, but actually they've they've actually looked at all the the, the um, documentation in terms of that. What they tend to do is that they 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 use that term because they they feel that if they can't achieve the outcome that the complainant wants, in that particular instance, they didn't bother to investigate it. I mean, I think maybe the easiest thing to do for that one is. If you're happy, I'm very happy to share the report, the Ombudsman report, with you, so you can actually look at what the Ombudsman has actually said, and it might, you know, it, um, show you what what they actually found in that respect. So I'm very happy to do that. Okay, that's good. Anything else, Councillor Sweeting? Okay. Um, I, I will just remind members if you do have any further questions, we are pushed for time. But if you do have any questions, please ask them through Neil. He'll be happy to liaise with the officers outside of the meeting and get the answers for you. Could I just say one last thing before I disappear? Yes, of course. Um, I think what I've discovered having done this three times now is that um, next year, if I'm around, I'll just produce one report which covers everything. Because I think what you want is some of the detail in adult social care, the children and housing, all that stuff. But actually all of that's gone to the social care committee. But it's a public document and there's no reason why, if you wanted to read it, that you're not entitled to read it. So. Um, so next year, I will be happily provide one report which incorporates the whole lot so you can then look at and see what all the data is showing. Thank you. Uh, and it will still have to go to individual committees, though, will it? Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you. Had, sorry, to, I have to say that we've got 300,000 residents. The number of inquiries is minuscule. And I think that says a great deal for the way that this council operates. 
and thank you, Ian, for the way that your department handles those very few complaints. Thank you very much, and thank you for your attendance, Ian. You're free to leave whenever you wish. Item 7 is our quarterly schools place planning update. Um, welcome to you, Dan and Sarah, and thank you for your patience. Whenever you're ready, feel free to give your presentation. Right. Um, this is quite a short report because um, there's a number of proposals and actions currently being considered by members, and once we have some steers on that, more information can come back to the committee. The, it's clear that one of the biggest issues is it's absolutely clear that we've got increasing demand for Year 7 places that's the start of secondary school for at least the, the seven year, next seven years. And it's clear because we've got seven years of high numbers in primary already. And even with a drop-off rate, with them being dumped behind alleyways, whatever, there will still be large numbers of children um, coming through um, because the primary numbers are not rising as much as they were, but they're just steady they've reached a sort of bumpy plateau that goes a little bit up and down. So we are looking at, op we've presented to members options to look at how to meet the increase in secondary school places and also how to deal with the very few primary schools that have pockets of places which are causing them problems in organising their classes and um, budget worries. The issue that if the class, if they're meant to have 90 in a year group and they have 60, um, then they only need two classes. If they have 62, technically, because of the infant size, class size limit, they need to have three classes. But they don't just have, and if it goes up from 60 to 62, um, they don't just have another class for the other two. They have to reorganise all 62 into three classes. So we actually have hundreds of children who've been moved around um, in, a, in a very few, about less than 10 schools. And um, we want to stop that by um, some variations to reduce the planned admission number in a few schools where we're sure that there will still be parental choice in the area. And to also operate some temporary caps on specific year groups, again, that idea that most of our primary schools have a planned admission number of 90, that where they can't be reduced in size, but they've got some year groups that have already come down to 60, and there are places in other schools. It is ridiculous to have lots of neighbouring schools floundering around trying to find teachers and then trying to find the money to pay for them. Um, we can't just, you know, the, the children can't be just poured into the schools to um, match the spaces. It is due to parental preferences, and that's the other big theme that we've seen, that in the secondary phase, one of our extra pressures is there's certainly very low demand for one um, remote secondary school, Harefield, in the north. Um, and frankly, it is not useful to parents in Hayes to have places there, and it's not useful to Harefield. And there is one school actually in Hayes that is becoming less popular, um, and that then creates some turbulence and can make it difficult. It can actually mean that we end up with both some empty places in secondary and the need to create some extra places as we did this year um, for this September. But we think we've got options um, that we can deal with both issues um, and try and meet the needs of most parents. That's the short answer. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, Dan, would you like to say anything before I go to questions? No, just to, just to reiterate perhaps that, um, that, we've, that the, the process that we undertake each year is to refresh the forecast based on the latest population numbers which we've recently completed over <coughs> the summer. Um, so we crunched, we've crunched the numbers and we've provided an update report to lead members 
uh, with some options for how we meet secondary um, demand um, over the next few years. I, I should bear in mind that obviously this, is, this follows an already significant investment program by the Council in improving secondary education facilities as well as the primary. Um, so we've invested quite heavily in sc to expand schools and rebuild schools. So we have a number of um, newly built secondary schools across the borough which are offering some excellent education facilities for our residents. Thank you very much. I put out questions from members. Councillor Markham. Yeah, thank you. It's a bit deja vu and every four months we seem to get the same sort of report. I mean, it is very complex. Am I right in thinking we've got some 58,000 students? Yeah, well, I mean, inevitably there are going to be some people who are going to have problems. I noticed that the word options features quite heavily in, in this particular report by a number of times and I wondered when we might get sight of these options. Will it be before or after the decision making process has been made? Um, <laughs> naturally it will uh, naturally through the committee process, the cabinet process that obviously any, anything that requires an investment will obviously be in, in the public domain. Um, but I think, I think it's um, it is a complex business because obviously what we want to be able to do is to balance the need to make best use of our education resources, the, you know, the assets that are in our community. And so, you know, it's no surprise for me to say that actually we've looked at the options to expand. Um, and there, the, other, the other clear option that's, um, that's in, the, in the public domain already clearly is the um, decision already made by the Department for Education for a secondary free school. Uh, or two have been approved in the north of the borough, um, and um, as well, of course, you know, the, in, as Sarah said, one of the one of the big um, challenges with this is the parental preference, and so the actual um, demand from one year to the next um, it ebbs and flows. And so what we're looking for, I suppose, is where it rises to a peak, and then and then and then that is a temporary peak, and then drops drops off because. You don't. You wouldn't. One wouldn't want to necessarily invest to, to meet that peak because very shortly after you'd have spare capacity, and so it's actually trying to get a, a very careful balance between what I would describe as an optimal position, supplemented by some maybe some short-term extra classes in some schools, um, and so that's why we've presented a range of options to members to for them to consider and to, and for, to get instruction on what what is their preferred option. Yeah, I mean the big problem is finding sites for these schools. You know, is it housing or is it schools? Um, I noticed um, that this whole question about forecasting isn't an exact science. I mean, I noticed it says the forecast can only be a guideline, which requires interpretation and judgments to be applied. The DFE advised a five to ten percent margin should be considered in school places. I have to say, I congratulate you on what you're doing and the way you're actually managing to get every child into the school, by and large, the school that the parent wants. So congratulations. Thank you. Councillor Tuckwell. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Yeah, I echo that point. I mean, every, um, every four months or so, it's just a logistical kind of um, mammoth task, isn't it, to, to get this um, sort of organised well. Uh, the point I wanted to raise is we've got some schools which are right on sort of our neighbouring boundaries and how do we factor in sort of an intake of children from say Harrow, Ealing, um, particularly in the north, elsewhere in the south, how do we factor that into all of these calculations? In terms of our modelling, um, what, we, what we do take into account is a, is a degree of migration but you're absolutely right schools that <coughs> are typically on, on Hillingdon's border with a, with a neighbouring borough, um, particularly if they're popular uh, schools, will, will attract from uh, pupils or applications from outside um, Hillingdon's um, borough. And importantly, if there is already a sibling at the school, the uh, further application will attract higher priority, the sibling priority uh, in the school admissions criteria. Um, but it, you know, so it does ebb and flow from one year to the next and one of the things that we've seen, um, Sarah and I are looking at the figures this year, is, is that, um, a higher number of successful applications for selective schools from pupils living in the borough to for applications outside the borough, <coughs> so typically Slough or, or, or Buckinghamshire. So 
it can change from one year to the next, and so it's something we have to build in as, as part of our um, sort of contingencies and, and risks, really. Okay, uh, Councillor Sweeten. Thank you very much. Um, can I say, first of all, that yes, you have provided us with some information, but it's nowhere near as detailed as the information you provided us before, because um, what you provided us some time ago was um, something called the cohort survival rates, the role projections, which I thought we were getting today, and we haven't. And um, I have quite a few questions, which I know is not going to be possible this evening, but there's one or two points before I get to my questions. Can I look at page two, for example, table one? I think that is reception demand projections, yes, not year seven. Um, and can I just sort of clarify, is it places in reception or is it projections that you've got there? Because it says both. Because if it's places in reception, then the numbers are obviously not even. Um, but if it is, um, it would have been useful to have actually had the capacity versus the projection. And then we could have seen, as a committee, the percentage of unfilled places. Um, because we know, unfortunately, that we have got quite a few primaries that are having reductions in their numbers. And it has caused problems with that. So to have that piece of information with just capacity compared to projections and um, spare places as a percentage, 5 to 10 percent, because I think we are over 10 percent now. I mean, I'm suggesting 14 percent, but I may well have got it wrong. When I come to the secondary projections, I have got real concerns here, because what we have in the table two is a minus 16 when it comes to um, spaces in the south. And I've looked at the admissions, um, and it, you, you will have an update. Um, the year seven capacity in all of our secondary schools is 3767, or was at the 1920 um, um, admissions period. That meant that only 48 was unfilled places, of which 32 were hair-filled. And that brought us to 1.27% of unfilled places. Now, remembering what the Department for Education says is reasonable, between 5 and 10%, we have a situation now, and I've got it in my own ward, where parents are coming to me saying there's no options. There really isn't any options. And I'm getting, I would like to have information on what we are going to do. I can see from the projections that you are saying that there's a need for um, one form of entry in the, in, the, um, in, in the south of the borough going up to four. But does that mean that has taken into account the 10%, 5 to 10% surplus? If it doesn't, we need more than one FE. We need more than four FE. We possibly need more than eight FE. So this is not really giving us, I think, as a committee and the parents that may be watching that out there, a really good understanding of where we're going. We know that we've got enough spaces in our primaries, although some primaries are being affected by the, the drop. Um, but we have got this problem that we know that members are going to be considering, but they have been actually considering this for a number of years now, five years, and we still haven't got confirmed bulge um, classes, confirmed where the site for the school is going to be and what is happening in each part of the borough. When I was dealing with role projections for the borough, I divided the borough up into three areas, north, the middle of the borough, and the south, because sometimes it gives the wrong impression when you just have a north-south divide. We do it with our primaries. We've got 14 planning areas. So can I please ask for a more detailed report next time? I've got too many questions, and I've taken too much time from this committee. But I am disappointed, and there are some errors in this report um, uh, concerning, say, West Straton is a pocket of pressure. No, we've got reducing roles in West Straton at the moment. So... Um, I would be happy through the chair to list all of the things that we should have in the next report, if that's going to be possible, please. 
In light of the length of your uh, issues, Council Sweden, I'm happy to take it outside the meeting if you can liaise with uh, Neil and get those answers from the officers for the next meeting. That would be fine if members are in agreement. Oh, yeah, certainly. Thank you. Um, I know you didn't have a specific question, but do you have one before I move on? Or? Only, that it would be, sorry, only that it would be good to actually see specifics, please. Okay. Councillor Mavis? Can I... Um, can I just ask a little bit more on what um, Councillor Sweetie was talking about? So it would be really useful to get, w with this, the bowls classes, um, just to kind of look at the kind of, uh, it's not a short term fix, but you know, the kind of shorter um, term resolutions and the longer term. A and I would be very interested to find out um, more information around that movement. So we, we had a couple of meetings ago that, you know, those in the south tend to go to the central, those in the central go to the north, and those in the north may go out of borough. I know that's a bit generalisation, but you know that kind of movement. But, but I'm very keen to see a little bit more information on that, and if those trends continue, uh, as, as a bit more of an understanding of the statistics. But also, if there is any reason why we couldn't move to the to the north, central, and south um, project, uh, tabling and, and recording of things, place wise. Thanks. We are looking at that. The trends aren't as clear. That's one reason that there are lots of options. Um, and although there's movement from the north, the south, I did some work trying to work out where we would define the middle of the borough. Um, whether, um, and that was slightly difficult. I mean, because it sort of straddles the A40 because it's very clear that. Um, be, partly because of the, the, the two schools right in the north but almost on the A40 who I martyrs and Viners and then they've got a footbridge that actually leads to their entrance um, and certainly those schools are attracting um, al almost half or sometimes over half of their pupils they, they, they have a typical 360 degree but um, in the south of the borough, there is a complication in that there's a sort of almost an east-west split as well. So it would almost make... <coughs> I, we, would, we were seriously wondering how that that's not helpful because, the north, because there are movements from the south out sideways purely because of public transport is easier to go east-west than to go north-south sometimes. Um, but we, will, we are looking at those sort of issues and trends. And the fact that there aren't simple trends that, um, you know, one, I think it does say in the report here that for the first time for some years this year, the borough was a net exporter of pupils. Um, and that was partly because people didn't come in from Ealing and Harrow, but more got into the um, Slough Grammar Schools. Yeah. So you've got one Slough Grammar School that had a bigger intake than three of our own schools <laughs> of Hillingdon pupils. Dan, did you want to comment? Yeah, just, just to add, and we'd be more than happy to provide this committee with additional information. I suppose what, what I, I just, just in terms of the secondary um, level, just, just, to, just to sort of highlight that September 19 was was one of our uh, most significant peaks. It was a significant jump in terms of entry year into into year seven, and we successfully met that with uh, with, with expansions that we have made already. So that, which includes Viners, Ryslip High. Um, Oakwood, which we contributed quite significantly, Northwood as well. We, you know, we funded quite significantly the expansion. Swake has also provided an additional two, two forms of entry, so that equates to eight and a half forms of entry, or eight, eight and a half extra classes at Year Seven across the, the borough. And, and in addition to that, we we have historically had a number of spare places in the secondary sector for many years, and so it was it was it was it's filled up, and we've added eight and a half extra forms of entry. So we've, we've got to do the same again um, over, the, over the next few years. But it's broadly speaking, um, the, the whilst there is some, um, some demand over the next couple of years, it's, it's fairly, fairly stable. Uh, 
but the, the next peak is September 22 in terms of our forecast notwithstanding some of the some of the pressures and we should have made it a bit clearer we factored in a five percent um, sort of capacity in, in line with the guidelines but we'd, we'd be more than happy to provide extra information to this committee thank you council members do you wish to follow up yeah, I suppose um, just to, just for my knowledge and, and, and when talking to concerned parents for those with some of these pressures, particularly in secondary, that, that <coughs> exist, for those students who do have to, for example, travel from West Straight to Harefield, what, what is the council doing to support those families and help them w with those kind of travel arrangements and the, the, the pressure that can put on when, it, when it's not a choice but more a, that is the only option? And in, in response, we, we offer... Um, uh, uh, we make offers of school places which, which fit the sort of reasonableness test and so therefore we, f we follow guidelines um, but what we do do um, is um, provide parents with clear information about the sort of travel options. We've even gone so far with some parents to provide um, the exact times of buses and, and changeovers as well where, where, where parents take up those offers. Thank you, Councillor Vardia. Thank you. I acknowledge that uh, site constraints are an issue for secondary school expansion, but I wonder, I know that you're, that you're developing options, but I wonder whether you've had any preliminary discussions which, uh, with secondary schools which you envisage um, are in the pinch points where their expansion would help ease the pressure, and if so, how you are finding those. Um, we've, I mean, Sarah, Sarah in particular, but we've been in conversation with um, secondary schools for a couple of years about how best to manage um, some, some of these peaks and troughs. And one of the things that, that secondary heads have said to us very strongly is that they want to be part of the solution. And I have to say they've been very collegiate in terms of their, their, their joint working with the local authority uh, for, for our residents. And a number have said that you know they can offer um, additional places in their schools without additional accommodation, and so uh, there were a number of schools uh, for this September who collectively offered an extra 82 places, um, which obviously supported um, families and in terms of meeting their particular preferences. Now, what we want to know really is from schools and hence conversations that are ongoing now is. Um, can schools continue to do that for at least, say, the next couple of years, which then takes some of the pressure out of the system. Um, so as long as we get their commitment, um, then actually it's a, it's a best use of resources as well because we're not having to in invest in cap significant capital investment. And also it, just, it, it um, offers greater choice to families as well. Any principal follow-up, Councillor Havardia? No? Okay. Councillor Markham? Yeah, I'll pick up um, this question about accommodation, really. I mean, it is a, a big issue. I just feel it work, might be helpful if we had an update of those schools which require additional accommodation um, and some indication of how much we're going to have to be spending, you know, what the capital investment is in trying to help alleviate the problems of the increased secondary. And, and of course, the other major one is, is a new school or two new schools. Where on earth? Sorry, where in Hillingdon are they going to be? That surely is a huge challenge because there are particular requirements in terms of space, isn't it, and size for schools. And therefore, an update, I mean, this can't be anything new, so an update on what areas you're actually looking at, I think, would be helpful. Yeah, would be helpful. I believe that's all the questions. We will finish with one more councillor's meeting. Yep. Yeah. Use your microphone, please. The closing date for um, next year's admissions is the 31st of October, is it not? Could we just have a, a, um, a, a just a paper, maybe not for the next meeting, but the meeting after that, just to give us an indication of where we are with next year's admissions to Year Seven? Yep. Happy to do it. Thank you very much for your attendance, uh, Dan and Sarah, and your report. You're free to leave whenever you wish to do so. See you uh, before then. Shouldn't sorry. be much longer. <laughs> <laughs> Item 8 is the Cabinet Forward Plan. Are there any questions or comments to raise? Mm -hmm. Councillor Sweeting? Thank you, Use the microphone, um, please. Thank you. I see that the adoption of the Hillingdon Local Plan Part 2 has slipped till December. Um, I believe everything 
has been sorted with that, and I was just wondering why um, it's not going to an earlier cabinet meeting. Are you able to comment, Neil? Or I, I'm not aware. Of I'm not aware of, any of the of the reason for that, Mr. Um I can find out. Last question. Okay. Is that all? Okay. Can we agree that? Yeah, yeah, yep. yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. Item nine is our work program. Neil, I believe you had s some issues from Councillor Calvin. Was it? it wasn't Calvin. It wasn't issues. It, um, thank you, Chairman. Um, well, no, I can't review. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. So you might recall at the last meeting, um, Councillor Calvin mentioned that his um, his uh, that Mrs. Calvin was involved with litter picking groups in South Rystep. So myself and the chairman have been looking at sites that the committee might wish to visit or actively to get involved in as part of the review. And we thought that it might be of interest to the, count to the committee to actually attend one of those litter picking groups. So um, they actually happen on the third Saturday of each month. Um, so the next two are this Saturday and then um, on the uh, 16th of November. So if the committee is minded, I can do to arrange something on that basis. Potentially even tie that into then combining that with or having it follow or proceed, sorry, a, uh, a day of or a couple of hours of following some of the street enforcers about how they go out their work and challenging some of the and, and some of the litterers and um, uh, actually applying some of the fines. So I don't welcome any comments on that. Are there any comments? <coughs> I can't manage it better today, but I don't know if you'll be that quick. This Saturday might be short notice, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Can it not be written, or does it have? To, do we have to be there to? It's, it's not compulsory to attend. I mean, obviously, whoever does attend, we will feed back at the following meeting of what went on and what was said. But uh, I would invite all of you to attend if you're free to do so. Councillor Tuckwell. Yeah, I, I've, I've been on a couple of the um, uh, the litter picks and actually had um, some young pupils from Queensmead um, a few nights back so did a did a Sunday litter pick, which was which was good. But I think it would be good to have um, some insight into the, the enforcement side of things. If that could be arranged, um, that would certainly be um, something that might be of interest to this committee. So, yeah. so is the committee more interested in the enforcement side of things than perhaps the litter picking activity? Would you like to do both, just the one? I think it would be good to do them all on one day, and if members wish to choose which one they'd rather go to, or maybe both, make it flexible for all members, I think that would be the best way forward. I'll, yeah. I'll look into yeah. both, and I'll advise committee of the date. Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, is there anything else before I move um, on? Councillor Sweeting? Sorry, Chair. Um, I thought that there was going to be a report going to Cabinet on youth services. Yes. And I can't see that anywhere here. And we're getting it on um, in our January report. But if, if nothing has gone to Cabinet, is it coming to us first and then going to Cabinet? Which is really what I'd like to happen, yeah. but I don't think that's going to be possible. Yeah. But where is it? Where's it? Where have you got to, please? Yeah. I'm not entirely sure exactly where in the process that report is in terms of going to Cabinet, so I'll, I'll find that out and we can potentially rejig our work programme accordingly. Okay. Thank you all very much. That concludes our business for this evening. I wish you a very safe journey home. Good night.